What up guys, it's Mr. E. I'm here to do a tutorial for you guys of Hero Siege. This might be a long video, but I have it cut up into seg points, so feel free to check the description below if you guys want to skip to any part of the video. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Hero Siege, and let's get to learning. Alright, so first things first guys, this game uses an anti-cheat engine to try to keep people from hacking and duplicating and all that other stuff that nobody really wants in a seasonal game. Well, if by chance you're having an issue and the game will not launch or you're having problems to where it crashes on start or something, it could be an anti-cheat problem. If so, check uh, my videos. I do have a guide on how to possibly fix that problem for you. So feel free to check that out and see if that's something that will be helpful for you. But now that you are, let's say, on the main menu, one of the first things you want to do is check your options. Here on the main menu is the only place where you can change your frame rate. I don't know why I've brought this up many seasons ago, but it hasn't changed, so if you want to change your frame rate, now is where you would do it. So whether you play on 60, 120, or 144, that's up to you. I feel like a lot of people are having issues playing at 144 in this game. I know I do. My game tends to go super slow motion, and I don't know how to fix it. I've tried a lot of things, so I just default back to 60. I feel like this game is optimized for 60. I really do. So I think that if you're comfortable with 60, just stay with 60. This is where you would change any of your video options. If you decided you wanted to change the darkness or the combat or the chat at all, um, you can change it from full screen, to windowed, and all that good stuff. There's some other stuff right here I'll point out when we get in game. And then you can also change your audio this right here is specific to drops that you'll get in a higher difficulty. They all have a specific sound. So if you want this sound to be louder, so it catches your ear like quicker, you can pull it louder. Or if you want it quieter because it's too loud, then, you know, just slide it down. I don't recommend the music. Probably one of the worst in-game soundtracks that I've ever heard. So I don't recommend it, but feel free to listen to it. Also, I'm not a huge fan of the voice acting, so I turned that off. In controls, you have the option to choose between a keyboard and a controller. Yes, it's PlayStation and Xbox and probably Steam. I have never tried the Steam or PlayStation, but it is. It'll work. Um, I don't particularly use a gamepad. I like to use keyboard. It's just more convenient for me. But this game is optimized to run with a controller, so feel free if you guys want. This game is also obtainable on uh, the App Store through your phone, so if you do want to buy it on your cell phone, by all means feel free. It is not optimized to run well on a phone, and most people who do buy it on their phone use it to do trading and stuff through the auction house in-game, or to just talk in the chat and you know hang out it has some really big issues with lag and freezing on the phone so it's up to you if you want to spend the extra money to have you know another version on your phone so now that you've went through all of that there's two options here do i play on local or do i play on online well let me explain the difference between that because that's something that might come up so local is your own personal game on your PC saved to files on your PC and you'll never be able to play seasonal or get rewards at all so if you decide you want to ever play multiplayer if you ever decide you want to play seasonal if you ever decide you want to try to win re rewards for playing you want to go to the online version this is the only place where you're gonna ever meet anyone um, there is ways to go into local and to plug in an editor and do testing. And that's something I can teach you guys in another video, which I already have. 
So feel free to check out that video, Hero Siege Editor, if that's something you guys are interested in. For now, we're going to go into the online, where most of you are actually going to play. So first thing, you're going to want to click the registration button. You have to register your account. It's very important because you won't be able to make a username and password to log in if you don't. This only takes about 30 seconds, so feel free to just go through and do it. It's very easy. Once you've got yourself all logged in and set, you'll see that the next option is to choose a class. So you'll have your character select screen with a bunch of empty spots to fill in with characters. Before we go on and choose a character, you'll see this little tab over here to the right. If you click on it, this is where you would see how many hours you've played on each class. This is not per season, this is in total. So, as you can see, I've played quite a bit. <laughs> but uh, I have been around for 10 seasons, so this is all of the gameplay I've played on all these characters. Some of them are somewhat newer classes, and some of them I just haven't really had a chance to play a lot of, but I'll get around to it at some point. So let's go ahead and choose a character. So click on an empty spot, and we'll go to the character select page. So now that we're at the character select page, you'll see that there are, what, 19 classes to choose from. A lot of them might say locked for you, or unobtained in order to get that you actually have to go into steam and you have to buy the dlc content majority of the classes are dlc content like based but you do get a decent amount or should i say a handful of characters for buying the base game so it's not unreasonable for them to ask for a little bit of money for you to buy the extra classes so before we go and pick a character, there's a couple of things I'll point out. There is a seasonal mark right here, and there's a hardcore mark right here. This is determined whether or not you want to play on, like I said, the seasonal, where you it runs for about a four-month period, and in that four-month period, you compete to see if you can get on the leaderboards to earn rewards against other people in the world. You can choose to not play that, but you'd almost be playing like an SSF um, or a local type of game where you're not playing with anybody. This game doesn't normally run in the non-seasonal category, so you won't find a lot of people playing it. So it makes it a lot harder for you to gear up and whatnot. But if it's something that you really want to do, it, there's no reason you can't do it. It allows you to continually save and play and you can still talk with people in the chat and see what's going on. You just won't be able to, you know, play with anybody pretty much. So it's up to you if you want to do it. Um, your stuff will continually save forever and non-seasonal and it won't delete unless by chance the developers go through a process where they start changing things. But as far as we have it now, they don't do that. There's also the hardcore option. This is where you'll usually find me. I'm usually playing hardcore. Um, what's the difference between just normal seasonal and seasonal hardcore? If you die in hardcore, you're perma dead and you have to start the season from scratch. Nothing you have pretty much saves except for your currencies and anything you have saved in your stash tab. There's also some trade skills like mining it doesn't get deleted either thank god <laughs> but besides that everything gets wiped so choose wisely if you decide to come to hardcore if i was you and this is your first playthrough i recommend at least giving the game a playthrough on softcore which is just seasonal that way you can learn the whole you know ups and downs what's not to do what's to do which enemies to look out for you know, just the little basics that everybody should know about the game. This will give you the benefit of being able to go into hardcore, feeling a little bit more confident about what you're doing, and, you know, put a little bit more fear into you. Because, in my opinion, if you're not playing hardcore with a little bit of fear, then it's going to get you killed. 
You literally need to have a little bit of fear, something that stops you from doing stupid things. You know what I mean? So I recommend, if I was you, to uh, go in and try softcore first. Give it a campaign run, and after the first campaign run, if you feel like this is way too easy, I want to try hardcore, then please come join us in hardcore and we'll have a good time. So once you decide whether or not you're playing seasonal or seasonal hardcore, which is what you'd have to checkpoint, you would want to now choose a character. So let's say you just pick a character. Every single one you pick is going to have its skills off to the left. And then at the top, it's going to tell you what benefit you have for playing that character. Every class has a specific like benefit and it's up to you whether or not you choose it on that benefit it's not it's not huge none of the benefits they get are like holy crap this is like game breaking but some of them do help a little bit such as demon spawn demon spawn gives you the ability to fly at the beginning what does it mean to fly um basically to fly it means that you don't have to worry about falling in a hole. You don't have to worry about traps that try to stab you from the ground because you fly over top of it. It's just a huge benefit to have flight. But every class in this game can get flight, and we'll talk about that more when we get there. So if you decide you want to choose, let's say, Demon Spawn at the beginning, which is a DLC character, it's up to you if that's the reason you would want to pick it. So once you decide on a character you want to play, Make sure you give it a name, and it can't be an offensive name. If it is, there's a chance that you might get your account banned, or a dev might change your name to something random that you're not going to like. Pick a name that you actually will like, because it costs a lot of in-game currency to rename yourself. So I don't recommend picking something that you plan on changing soon. Pick something that you're happy with right off the bat. And if you don't pick a name, the game will automatically just give you the same name as the character and that's not a good thing because there's quite a few actual hackers that come into the game and they choose to just pick no name and it just gives them the default character's name so you might be somebody that gets targeted and thought of as maybe a hacker if you don't actually use a unique name which is something that i definitely recommend so after you pick your character, you'll see it goes down here. If you're seasonal, you'll have the yellow outline. And if you're um, non-hardcore, you'll just see like a box in the back that's concrete. If you're hardcore, you'll see the skulls in the background. And if you're non-seasonal, you'll see this red outline. So that's how you can tell once we get into the lobby, whether or not somebody's in hardcore, whether they're in non-seasonal, or whether they're in seasonal. So choose your character, you'll see the option to go to a shop, let's go ahead and go to that first. So I want to talk about the shop a little bit. So once you're in the shop, you'll see that there's a bunch of stuff you can purchase. All of this is completely up to you whether or not you want to actually buy it, or if you just want to skip it. However, I do recommend buying at least one thing, and that is a stash tab stash tab is very awesome i didn't buy this one this is an extra hundred i don't need it but there is a dlc stash tab that gives you plus 100 to your stash and plus 100 to your inventory and that one i definitely recommend having an extra 100 spots in your inventory is huge Especially if you decide you want to collect in-game currency or you don't want to keep going back to town to break gear down over and over again, having the extra convenience of slots is awesome. And it's quite cheap to buy, so I recommend. Uh, there's also the Gates of Valhalla DLC. This is technically the only real content DLC, so if you want to expand the game and have extra, you know, zones to travel through and enemies to kill and a boss and what and so forth and so on. I do recommend buying the Gates of Valhalla DLC and I believe it does come with a class called Jotun. 
So at least you get that as well. So that's a second thing that I do recommend purchasing if you decide you like this game and you want to continue to play it. Moving on, we'll move on to the clothing section. In the clothing section, you'll see that we have a hats option, which is just something for cosmetics for your character. A lot, some of these hats can be found in-game through purple chests and a bunch of them are actually buyable using in-game currency. So that's something I tend to do at the end of the season. I will come in here and buy all of the ones I don't have using currency um, that I didn't spend throughout the season. There's also uh, the option to have all of the ones from the in-game, or sorry, from the Steam uh, DLC content. So there's a lot that Steam DLC um, some of them are through the Steam inventory, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then some of them are seasonal stuff that you get through, um, you know, certain events that come through in the game during the season. So, we'll move on to the skins. Almost all of the skins are DLC content or through the Steam inventory. Uh, there's also companions. Companions walk around and help pick up keys, gold, rubies, just currency pretty much, and keys. They don't really pick up any gear, like loot or anything, so don't expect that. You also will get this uh, goose right here for free, and I believe this tower for free. And I'm not sure about this one, but you'll definitely get these two for free. When you link up your account um, and verify it, that's something that you'll actually have to do no matter what if you decide you ever want to trade with anybody in the game or use the auction house. So make sure you guys verify and link your account, and that's something that you can do quite easily. Next, you'll look at accessories. Accessories is just pretty much wings or stuff that go on your back, and these are primarily through the supporter packs and through um, the Steam inventory. However, there is a couple wings that you guys can get for free in-game, and that's something I will show you guys in another video. Next, we'll move on to the interface. This is where you'll have just options to have sigils. Most of some of these sigils you unlock by leveling up your character throughout the season. Other ones are depending on whether or not you own specific classes that you bought out of Steam. And then other ones are ones that you can't even get anymore. Because they were ones that were offered from seasonal rewards. I don't know why they even give you the option to see them if you can't get them, but they were from seasonal rewards. And then on top of that, there are some that were obtained through like Steam purchases or um, supporter packs for the game. So those are in here as well. Uh, you have the option to change your UI color. So that's where this comes in, is you can change your UI and what it looks like at the bottom of the screen and whatnot. You also have the option to go and change your name color. So if you want the name above your head to be any specific color, it also will change the dot on the minimap, depending on what color you choose. So you can change that right here in the name color options. Next, we'll look at seasonal rewards. This is something that will show you from season one all the way up to season 17, what rewards are obtainable and what was obtainable. So as you can see, it's now season 17. And if you place in the leaderboards and you get in the top 35, you have an option to, to get this banner right here. If you end up getting into the top 10, you get a different banner. And if you get into the top three, you get another banner. If you get in the highest ranking, you get all three. If you get in the second highest ranking, you'll get the second and third place prize and so on and so forth. They only offer three prizes throughout the season. And this is something depending on your ranking at the very end of the season. This isn't, oh, I reached this ranking, so now I get it unlocked. No, this is based on 
the final ranking at the end of the season. So that's cool. You can go back if you've unlocked certain uh, rewards through past seasons. You can wear them in the next season and it just moves forward. It allows you to use cool cosmetics that other people might not be able to because they weren't playing during those seasons. So that's something cool that you can look forward to if you decide to play this game for multiple seasons. Going into the Steam inventory. This is where you'll see while you're playing the game Steam keeps saying, you got something new, you got something new, and it just keeps stacking. It says you got a bunch of new things in Steam. Basically, it's these boxes. You're going to get tons and tons of these boxes that you unlock while you're playing the game. And in order to open these boxes, you have to have keys. The keys are obtained by two means. One mean is you go into Steam and you purchase them with actual currency. Um, with whatever currency that is through your country, you purchase on Steam the keys for that currency. I believe it's somewhere between one to two dollars and fifty cents or something in American. And you basically click on the box and it shows you all the options you have to be able to find something. Um, it's categorized by rarity, and you can see over here, superior is way more common than angelic, which is super rare. These skins that are in these boxes are also tradable. So if it's something that you guys want to, let's say, gamble with, you guys could spend money on keys, open chests, try to get the rare stuff, and then resell it on Steam. Or you could keep it and use it. Or you could trade it with your friends via trade. So let's say you opened up 10 boxes, you found like, I don't know, let's say you just found this skin right here twice, which is quite valuable probably. You could always ask your friend who has a different box skin, like for example, let's say your friend has this one, Let's say you can offer to do a trade. You're like, hey, I got two of this one. I'll trade you for yours. And if your friend wants it and he likes it, he could trade with you via Steam. It's not something that's tradable within the game. This is all through Steam. So it is, uh, it is an option. You can do trades. You can just give um, the skins to your friend if you don't want them. Vice versa. This is what the Steam inventory is. And if you decide, let's say you want to use these items, all you do is click on it and you click equip. It's that simple, that easy, and you'll see it in game as soon as uh, you do that. This is where you get some of the allies that you'll see on the, the companions section. This is where you'll see some really cool looking sprites that you can have on your gear. I have a couple of them. So there you go. This is the whole Steam inventory thing. And this is what you'll find inside of the shop. So going back to the lobby. Pick your character and click play. Once you're in the lobby, you have the option to one, join the discord, which I recommend. I think the discord is great. It's where we'll get most of the announcements for patches, updates and vice versa where you can report bugs that you've seen in the game it's where you can find friendships if you want it's where you can find a bunch of toxicity if you want there's always going to be trolls there's always going to be toxic players there's always going to be haters it's not something we can do anything about but you will find it in almost every discord channel um you can also one-on-one -on -one talk with the devs um if you have advice or have questions you can also find a lot of Twitch streamers like myself, there's a place for you to post your advertisements if you're a content creator, so you can do that as well. And you know, you can also look at the trade option on there if that's something you want. There's trading on the Discord channel as well. So make sure you join the Discord, it's worth it, and we welcome you to, uh, you know, be a part of it. So besides that, there's a bunch of different options down here on the right. You'll see that there's refresh, which literally just refresh the lists. 
This is just players that have made accounts and games and they put a password on it. So you'll see the ones that have it locked and those who don't. You also see which difficulty they're in over here. Um, normal is the white skull, nightmare is the blue one, and hell mode is the red one. You have the option to check the leaderboards. This is where you'll see where players are ranking up throughout the season. You'll see the solo rankings, which is um, a class individual push. So you can choose to look at each class if you want. This is, for example, how far on, what, day five of this season that Marksman has pushed so far on the leaderboards. So one person has went 44 wormholes deep. In this game, they have wormholes. In Diablo, they have greater rifts. So it's pretty much a greater rift from Diablo, but they call it wormhole. And this person has pushed 44. Is there a limit to how far somebody can push? Not exactly. It's really up to that individual on how much time they have to play and whether or not their gear can keep up with the in-game content that keeps getting harder as you push. Um, there's duo ranking, which is where you and one other person push the leaderboards. There's trios and then there's quads. Quads is as far as it can go, so if you want to play with three other individuals and push, you guys can. This game also has... A little bit of a multiplayer issue with crashing and some stuff not working occasionally so look forward to that if you decide to play a lot of multiplayer um, i'm sure they're working on it to get it better but it's something that we've seen multiple seasons in a row with a little bit of issues um, also a little bit more lag if you play with a bunch of friends and they're spamming skills all over the screen it sometimes tears into your game as well, so you'll see a little bit of a problem with that. Um, hero levels, these are basically like paragons. So in Diablo, they have what's called the paragon system. Once you reach max level, the next level starts stacking into something called paragons. In this game, they have hero levels. So this is as far as somebody's pushed so far on the hero levels. And... This is the leaderboards. You can see where your rankings are right here. The only ones that get rewards are Diamond, Master, and Challenger. You will not get rewards for Platinum, Gold, Silver, or Bronze. However, if it, you think that it's cool just to be able to have a ranking in general, feel free to you know push the leaderboards a little bit and you'll see that in the lobby, those who do have the little symbol over their head and it tells you what rank they're in. So. That's cool if you want to be noticed and you want people to see where you're at. Besides that, there's two other things I want to talk about. There's a region swap right here. So every single one of these is a, its own server. So I am from the West, so I tend to play on the West server. However, you might be from Europe, so maybe you'll have better connection on Europe. If you're in Australia, if you're in Brazil, if you're Chinese, if you're Russian, you know, if you're Korean, you might want to change region to, you know, fit the better connection for you. So this is where you would do that. And everybody has their own chat. So if you type something in, let's say, US West and then said, you know what, I think I'm going to go over to Europe. The chat's going to be completely different. Everybody inside of the lobby is going to be completely different. Everything's going to be different. So they're not connected in any way. After you choose the region that you want to play, now is a good time to set up a guild. You don't have to make a guild, but the benefits of having a guild is actually quite nice. You get a damage increase, you get a currency drop increase, you get a, a movement speed increase, and you get a XP increase. So it's worth it just to make a guild. Um, joining a guild means nothing. Technically you can if you want to join a friend's guild. But no matter what, you're going to have to level up your own get, like portion of the guild by yourself. You can't just join a guild that's been maxed out or anything to get the benefits. That's not an option. So basically, if you join someone else's guild, all you're doing is getting a little tag over your head by your name that just has the same tag as your friend. That's it. You're not actually getting any benefits from being in their guild. You just get to share the same tag. 
So I recommend just making your own guild. As you can see over the seasons, I've just kind of randomly made guilds as the seasons went on. Sometimes I join the same guild, but uh, make yourself a guild. It's worth it before you go into the game because it starts adding up quickly as you complete maps. And if you choose to play the game and forget to actually put the guild on, you might regret it later because it kind of sucks to miss out on all that extra benefit, you know? Once you've made a guild, next thing you're going to do is create a game. So you hit the create game, you'll have the option to change your um, surfer name if you want. Most people don't, they just leave it as their default name because it's easier for their friends to find them or whatnot. Um, you'll have the option to put a password if you want to lock it so that others can't join you. You can, you know, spam whatever you want. Or you can put in something as simple as like 123 or whatever is easy for you to remember if you want. You'll have the difficulty modes. You'll notice that Nightmare and Hell are locked permanently at the beginning. That's because you have to beat the campaign in each one of the modes first. So you beat normal mode, and then once you beat normal mode, you'll have nightmare mode unlocked. And once you've beaten nightmare mode, you'll have hell mode unlocked. And one of the most important things that people don't normally know that I'll explain right now is in order to unlock nightmare mode from normal mode, you don't have to travel beyond act six. There are eight acts in this game if you own the Valhalla DLC. And you don't have to actually travel into Act 7 whatsoever if you don't want to early. You just have to get up to Satan in Act 6, kill him, and then it'll unlock Nightmare Mode. Once you get into Nightmare Mode, it's the same thing to get into Hell Mode. You just have to get to Act 6, kill the boss, and then you can move on to Hell Mode. There is one cool shortcut in this game as well, if you want to skip forward quicker. If you happen to have a friend who has already beaten their way all the way to hell mode, all you have to do uh, is join their game, have them either clear the bosses, every single one of them, from 1 to 6 in normal mode, and then it'll unlock Nightmare, go to Nightmare, and then they can just teleport you straight to the end boss and kill that, and it'll unlock hell mode, or they can do the opposite. They could skip you straight to the end boss on normal mode and then clear all of the bosses on nightmare mode in order to get you to hell mode. That would be the absolute fastest way for you to skip it if you really wanted. It's a shortcut, but the option is available. And like I said, it takes a friend. There's no other way for you to do it by yourself. So other than that, you're just going to play the game normally, you're going to run through every zone, you're going to kill the bosses in every act, and then you can swap straight to the next difficulty if you want after you beat Act 6. Down here is a difficulty meter. You'll see that at the beginning, if you don't slide the difficulty, you'll be at level 1. And you don't get any negatives or any bonuses. Um, the green is the bonus and the orange is the negative. And you can slide it all the way to the right if you want. And you'll see that monsters get more HP, they do more damage to you. But you also have a better chance at finding drops because of magic find, and then you also gain XP quicker if you do that. I do not recommend trying this game on the max difficulty at the beginning, but it's up to you what you want to try. I don't think that difficulty 2 or 3 is too hard, but once you get into the 4 and 5 category, you'll start seeing like huge damage from you getting chunked from monsters just doing a normal hit or uh, you just having difficulties killing them because they have way more HP. So if you want to level quicker I don't think going into max difficulty at the beginning is better because it takes you longer to, to actually push. So I think somewhere in the middle is probably your best shot if you want to try a little bit harder. Other than that just go into the default and try that. Oh hey, it's me, I'm back. I'm down here on the bottom. So yeah, once you guys are in game, you'll see that your character is right here. You have uh, your name right above your head. You have your companion if you happen to have one. Um, I named my Fenrir. Yeah. 
Um, first things first, you'll see that there's this little point down here on the bottom left. Go ahead and click on that. This will bring you to your talent tree. And in your talent tree, you'll have an option to plug in one point. Read over the talent points and figure out which one you want to put in. They are very helpful at the beginning and will help you get through the tutorial much easier. You also see at the very top of uh, the skill on the top right, right around this area, that there's uh, an axe and a flame that uh, happen to show up on certain skills. They might not be on all of them, but they're on certain ones. And when you see that, the axe represents attack power and the flame represents ability power. What this means is if you happen to find any gear or if you happen to plug in anything that has attack or ability power, they will add to the damage of that skill. So by plugging in um, ability power into your gear, you will see the damage of that skill increase and so on and so forth. If it only has the flame, it'll only work with ability power. If it only has the axe, it'll only work with attack power. If it has both, then they just add together uh, equivalently. So that's what those symbols mean, if anybody is asking. Um, if the skill says passive on it, it means that it will work automatically, and it normally works off of a proc. So you can see on this one it says proc chance is 18%. That's normally something that you will see while holding down the left click, which is your just your passive shooting. So while you're using your passive shooting, you have a chance that when you have one point into this, it will throw a grenade. Um, if you see one that says active on it, like this one, it will go down on your skill bar down here on the bottom left, and it'll be on a cooldown of some sort. So actives are on cooldowns, and they plug into specific buttons you have assigned to them. So most of you are going to have like one, two, three, and four down here. I went in and changed my hotkeys to be mostly mouse. So it's just mostly left click and right click for me. I feel like that's easier. You guys can do the same if you would like. And you'll also see that on some skills, they tell you what damage type it requires. So besides the ability power and the attack power, it looks like Marksman focuses mostly on physical damage which is what you can see at the bottom of the skill. Or at the top, I guess they both say it. So physical damage is what the marksman relies on. If you were to plug in damage off of gear on this. Another thing to point out, which they just changed this season actually, season 17. And I'm sorry, if this is a tutorial from the past, um, hopefully it's up to date with uh, the current season that you're on now, but for now, we're going to go over the basics of what I can do and explain to you what is, you know, up to date. So, ability power and attack power are also derived off of strength and energy now. So, attack power is based on strength and ability power is based on energy. So, if you happen to find gear as you're running around and you're not sure if you should st stack energy or stack strength, that is very dependent on the skills you're using now. So if your skills say that they have the axe and the flame, then if you have a lot of strength and a lot of energy, then they'll both work the same. There's no difference, basically. If you just have a bunch of axes, then you want to stack strength. If you have a bunch of flames, then you want to stack energy, so on and so forth. And energy and strength are both basically the same as ability and attack power. So, why do we have both in the game? <laughs> to be honest, uh, uh, pick pick your pick your poison. You know, stack ability power, stack attack power, stack strength, stack, stack energy. Find what works best for you. Which gear has the most? Which one you like the best? And go from there. So, as far as I'm gonna choose, I think that the turret is probably one of the best choices at the beginning for the marksman. It literally will carry you through. Um, the introductory tutorial area um, and hero levels isn't something we have to worry about right now because you only unlock that once you hit level 100 which is going to take most of you guys like three days to a week probably to get to 100 depends on I guess uh, how much time you have to play how many times you die throughout the run 
Um, if you're crashing, you know, just there's the little things that could make you stumble along the way. But hopefully it doesn't take you too long to hit max level, which is 100 uh, at this current time. Mercenary is locked for now. This is something that I'll explain up in here in a second. But for now, just plug in one point and let's move on. You'll see that at the very beginning there will be a uh, weapon. Go ahead and pick it up. Whichever weapon it is, it will automatically apply and put it on itself. Run over to this quest marker and just, you know, it'll automatically apply once you run up to it. So run up to it. You see the skill we picked is on our hotbar now. So go ahead and just hit it while you're running through. You could use your left click or whatever you have designed as your attack option to start shooting things. I'm going to go ahead and just run through real quick and show you guys what the tutorial is. It's literally, you know, just a map. Make sure you run over and hit every single one of the question marks because that's part of a quest line. It's a hidden one. You'll see that as soon as we got to this question mark, a quest line popped up over here. So just keep going. Use your uh, skills and your left click to just kill everything as you go through. Space bar is, is automatically jump. Is you If you see this gap right here, if you fall in it, you'll die. But luckily they have a safety net to where if you hold like, let's say you hold and run into it, you don't instantly fall in. However, it does make it kind of nice because if you're holding towards the run, let's say you're running towards the hole and you hit space, it will jump over it. So don't think that you have to do like a running jump it's not necessary. You can just run into it and then jump. Most people don't know that. They'll instantly think, oh man, I don't know if I can make this, uh, you know, like jump. And <laughs> sometimes they'll accidentally do something stupid and hit backspace and fall in the hole. I don't know. Anything's possible, but you don't have to worry about it as much if you just run into it and then jump. So that's something. Moving forward, let's kill all these guys. Here's the quest marker. It says kill this guy. So let's take him out real quick. Luckily my turrets are doing some huge work to him. Hell yeah, he dead. Pick up all the stuff as we go. Kill the mobs. And then we're going to run into the next zone, which will complete the tutorial. All right. We, net, we made it to the town of Anoya. Congratulations, guys. You beat the tutorial. So now you're going to go up to the mayor and turn in the secret mission that you guys just did. He's going to probably give you a random relic, and I'll explain that what that is. So if you click escape, this is where you bring up the options menu, the shop menu. Um, there's a couple other things in here I'll explain in a second, but let's go to relics. So... Throughout your running around, you'll find these little, like, emote looking, like, animated, uh, well, a relic. You'll find these when you're running around. How do you know if they're good or not? That's questionable. It should tell you when you walk up to them what it does, but right now it doesn't. I think that's a glitch in the system. Um, they're probably going to fix that sooner or later. But for now, while I'm recording this, they don't have that option. However, I have made a relics guide on this YouTube channel. So feel free to go look up the relics guide if you want to know a little bit more about what the relics do, whether or not I like them or not. Feel free to check that out. That's one way to figure out what relics do. There's also the option of just picking up every single relic and seeing what it does. So for example, if I pick this up, it just says slice slice. That doesn't really help you at all, right? But what you can see is that it's now circling around me. I do explain this a little bit, um, each relic and what it does for the most part in my relic guide. But what you can do is you can go into the journal and there's a relics option right here. And if you've picked up the relic in the past, there's a chance that it will tell you now what it does or what it would normally say. Um, Unfortunately, I feel like this needs to be updated. It's not completely updated because it doesn't tell you the stats that it does. 
for some reason these just tell you like I don't know just like a little exclamation of what it would say if you picked it up it doesn't actually tell you what it does uh yeah this needs updated so checking this area isn't really going to help you I guess as much as I thought so forget that <laughs> Just worry about checking the relic on here. Most of the times it will tell you if you highlight it. Um, other than that, picking it up will tell you. Um, there's also one other option. So let's say the relic was right here on the ground and you're like, man, I want to pick up something that's right next to that, but I don't want to pick up the relic on accident because that's not one that I want. I just want to pick up the item that's on the ground next to it. So what you can do is go to options, go to end game, and there's something called relic confirmation. If you check mark that, it makes it so that when you accidentally click F or whatever button you have designed for picking up items, if you click on the relic, it will say, are you sure you want to pick this up? And you can say yes, or you could say no. I do not recommend turning it on if you're afraid you're going to die. Because you could be in a scenario where a relic drops on the ground out of a box or something. And you're surrounded by mobs and you're like, ooh, I want that one. And you run over to pick it up. Well, then the big pop-up will appear on your screen that says, are you sure you want that? And if you don't get out of that quick enough, the mobs are going to destroy you. <laughs> However, if you're worried that you're going to accidentally pick up relics that you don't want, because once you get all of these slots filled, you cannot pick up relics anymore. And... Sorry if I'm talking too fast. And if uh, you decide you don't want the relic, you can't just destroy one and get it off of you. What you have to do is you have to come over to this guy, which he's in every single town, and you have to say reset relics. By saying reset relics, which he says, are you sure? You say yes, you'll see it falls off, and now it's gone. You only have the option to reset every single one you have. You can't just say, uh, I want to just reset this one, or reset the whole row, or reset half, or reset this one, this one, this one, or this one. You have to just reset all of them. So keep that in mind when you're doing relics. I do recommend if it's your first playthrough and you haven't ran through the campaign yet, just pick them all up just to figure out what they do. Some of them are considered an active relic, and you can only have one active relic at a time. The active relic will will show a little icon up here and it normally falls under the button E and uh, that icon uh, will go on a cooldown when you use it usually none of them are usually instant um, they go on a cooldown right after use so you'll see that appear sometimes whenever you pick up an active relic and the cool thing about active relics is as long as your relics aren't completely full if you find another active relic all you do is walk over to it and click it and it will give you the option to replace the one you have currently with the new one so if you want to actually change your relics you can only the active ones though so once you're in town and you turned in that quest one thing that i recommend is that you run over to the mayor and grab the new quest by doing this he will give us a health and a mana potion you also get a little bit of the in-game currency, and you'll get a little bit of XP towards leveling up, which down here is your XP bar, and over here to the side is your currency meter with uh, keys, and the keys are used for opening up boxes as you run through. So go ahead and accept the quest. He wants us to go talk to a majority of the NPCs in here. While doing so, you might as well go ahead and pick up the other quests too because they're pretty easy and you'll get them done while running through the beginning zone, so might as well, right? Makes sense to me. Uh, as far as I know, this NPC is useless. It was just added as like a symbol of, I guess, thankfulness by P Pass. Somebody like donated a lot of money or something at one point, so they just added an NPC for him. And we keep running. Grab this guy's quest. And we got one more person to talk to. And then we can turn it in. 
All right, so once you've done that and you've turned it all in, you'll see that the two flasks that I mentioned dropped on the ground. Um, looks like sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't. This time, both of them are level requirement one. I have had problems in the past where some of them said level requirement four, so watch out for that. I don't know if that's still a thing, but luckily it looks like they gave us level requirement one. So you can choose. Do you want to use a mana potion or a health potion? I tend to like the health potion the most, and the reason why is because I can get more mana on my gear if I want, but I can't heal myself fast enough if I'm about to die. So let's say I take a huge chunk of damage and I'm down to like 10 HP out of 90. If I hit the potion, which you see it went on cooldown, you can't just keep spamming them, but once it goes on cooldown, I can hit it again once uh, it's off cooldown. And you can keep doing that to keep your health up if you want. That way uh, you don't have to worry about it. It does give you a huge chunk of your health back too. Um, and I don't think that the quality or um, the rarity makes any difference. Um, each one of them does the same. So if you have like a blue version, a yellow version, a purple version, it doesn't make a difference. The only thing that does make a difference is if it has a bonus skill like this, the stats will actually be a little higher depending on the quality and uh, the rarity probably. Also, um, each one of these items has an, a, a chance to be upgraded only at legendary or higher. So if you have a legendary piece and you go to upgrade it, which you can right click on each piece and say upgrade if it's legendary or higher, which is orange, um, it'll give you the option. There's also the option if you want to lock something, you can. So you can right click it and you can say lock. It'll put a little lock on it, a little icon. This makes it so that you can't accidentally break it down. So let's say I took it off of me, right? And I don't have any weapon on me right now. It was complete accident. I didn't mean to take it off. Or I had it on, right? But uh, when I had it on, I accidentally swapped it with one in my inventory. When I Like I clicked on it and swapped it. No, I didn't notice. Let's say I didn't notice at all. I had a crappy one on and my really super good ones in my inventory. Um, I go back to town and I'm like, man, I have a full inventory. I need to break some stuff down. If I run over to the um, NPC, he has an option to sell items. Click on that and click on the category where you were going to sell stuff. And let's say my item was in there. Um, this will allow you to not break it. Because you put a lock on it, it does not show up in the search bar for an item that can be broken. So if I click the X right here and I say sell all, It'll sell all the items in that, that category, regardless of what rarity it is. If it's a really super rare, like quality item, it will stop you and say, are you sure you want to break like this whole set of items? Because there's a rarity item in here and you can still say yes. But let's say that I did that and I go back to this category. Now my item's still here because you put that lock on it. It stopped it from being actually broken down when you broke all of the category. So that's one thing that makes uh, the whole locking system really nice. Um, it, it, it also kind of allows you to make a, a category on your own saying like, this might be one I want to sell later and I don't want to like break it on accident. Or this is one I might use later when I get to the level requirement or something. So you can put a lock on it so you don't accidentally break it later. There's also the option to go to the stash. And this stash allows you to hold up to 100 items unless you buy the DLC content that I recommended, which is extra storage and extra inventory. Then you get 200 stash spots instead. Um, it'll be 100. And it allows you to place one of your items inside the stash and it'll just take up one spot. So. The stash is really convenient, especially in hardcore. If you want to stash items away in case you think you might die. Um, if you do die, the items will save inside the stash. So a lot of players such as myself will keep like gems and runes and like rare items inside their stash after we find it. 
That way we don't have to risk like accidentally having them go poof. Um, you'll notice that inside the um, player category right here, which is under C by the way, you click the C button and it opens up uh, your character's uh, inventory as far as uh, his gear and his weapon and all that other stuff. So this is where all this would go. You can take it off if you want, or you can put it back on by clicking F, or you can put it back on by right clicking and saying equip. Um, currently it's not working with the lock on it. I don't know why, but uh, it, all you have to do is unlock it and lock it again. Um, there's also an option over here to do loadout. I do not recommend this. It was something that they added many seasons back and what it does is it allows you to put like a loadout so it'll put like a one next to all of the stuff that you decided to save as a loadout and then you can go back to the equipped loadout and you can choose which one you saved and it'll automatically throw the stuff from your bag onto you however there has been glitches in the past where people have had certain items just poof completely off their account and there has been no um, talk about it, whether or not they have fixed this issue or not. It seems to happen at least a couple times a season regardless. So I would say just skip this option. Now that we have the option to just lock and stuff, who cares? There, You don't need to, to switch loadouts, like, fast. They also make it to where you can't swap loadouts while you're running around in the wormhole area anyway. So if you're pushing leaderboards, swapping gear around isn't going to work because your stuff is locked once you get into that zone. So there's really no reason to do a loadout. So forget about that. that do, that's not even helpful. Um, you can inspect an item by clicking on it or clicking R. It will allow you to see it and then it will allow you to see the comparison to the item you're already wearing. Um, if you click tab, um, which isn't an option right now. But when you get a mercenary later, if you click tab, it will open up a side section where you can put gear on your merc. And I definitely recommend it because if your merc ends up dying, you have to buy it back using in-game currency again. So make sure you put stuff on your merc. Alright, so now that your character has some stuff, he went through and he did the main story mission where you talked to all the NPCs in town. You picked up all of the quests from the NPCs in town. Now, basically, your next objective is plug in skill points if you have them, which I do. I'm just going to stick them in there. And then, I guess you can look around if you want. There's None of the NPCs really have anything to talk about except for this one. Um, golden tokens are something that really haven't been used too much yet. There's something that I think are used for trading currency. So if you end up collecting a bunch of gold, you can then convert it into a token. And then I think you can sell that on the auction house over here to another player. That way you don't have to try to meet up one on one to trade a player because you can't sell gold directly on here. So I think that that's what the gold token is for. It's meant to be used as a trade currency um, for other currencies such as rubies. Um, in the crafting section, you'll see that there's mining. Mining is something that you won't get unlocked until you complete the quest line from this NPC. As you can see, he says go out and mine two, no, go out and mine 20 copper. So you won't have to worry about that until you do that mission, which will unlock this section for you. And then, uh, basically everything in there we can talk about, um, after I go for a few other things. Uh, the accessories area, this is where you have the option to spend some gold to craft keys if you want. I don't think that you should ever need to craft these keys anytime soon when you first start. You tend to find them on the ground quite often already, or they might pop out of a box or something. So picking up keys isn't really a necessity at the beginning um, as far as spending money. Um, definitely just pick them up for free if you see them. Um, this allows you to convert dust over from legendary to mythic, which is from orange to purple. 
Um, this is something you can do when you get further in the game and you start picking up a lot of legendaries and breaking them down. They give you dust in return. Um, if you go to the items section, there's the option to spend gold to get yellows, which are rares. There's the option to spend gold to get legendaries, which I don't think this is worth it whatsoever. Um, you end up finding a lot of legendaries early on anyway, so might as well just break the bad ones down for dust and then convert that dust into more legendaries right here. And then the option to use the dust that you converted over from orange to purple to craft a mythic if you want. Um, this is something I don't recommend until late in the game, like let's say you're level 60 or something and you've collected a lot of dust and you're starting to move on to harder difficulties, then maybe you'd want to start making this. But it's only optional, so you don't have to. Um, what else? There's the gems section. As you're running around in the game, you'll find these little baby gems. You then have the option to upgrade those gems to higher versions if you want. And then those versions can be upgraded to another, more versions later, and those versions can get, keep upgrading as you go. It's really up to you if you want to keep saving them, or if you want to uh, use them, or if you want to break them down. If you end up going to the NPC and saying sell, if you go into this bag right here, you'll see that there's a gem pouch, and there's a key ring, and there's probably other options later. But for now, the gem pouch is where you'll see the, the gems, and you could just sell them if you want, and you get gold. So. It's a good way to co collect gold early, is just selling the gems if you don't want to use them. Uh, the key ring is something that you won't actually use until way later on. And you have a potential to find uh, key drops that are for dungeons later, and that's where the key ring comes in handy. Um, there's also another tab that you'll get later called the jewel tab, and I'll show that off when we get there. So yeah, that's what this backpack's for. Um, it also will show you um, how much uh, currency you have as well. So you can also see the currency. Ah, okay, so here's the gem, the jewel crafting. I guess when I was in the NPC, you can't see it. It'll only show you the gems and the keys. Um, but yeah, there's the mining section, which is where you get like ore and stuff, and it'll be placed in there. You have the consumable section, which I don't really know um, I don't really know why we have that it's not really needed um, jewel crafting is something for the jewels later you'll see how much rubies and gold we have right now and how many of the normal keys we have for opening boxes so yeah that's basically what the bag looks like uh, the mailbox this is brand new for us but maybe for you it's not um, basically in the mailbox you have an option to send and receive mail and when you make sales on the auction house, your currency that you get will appear in here in the mailbox instead of you having to go over to the actual auction house to, to take it out, like withdrawal. So what you do is you go to send mail, you type in the recipient's actual account name, not their player name. So for me exactly, my name in game is Mr. E. That's what you guys know me by on YouTube as well. But my account name is Equin Oxide, like this. If you guys didn't know that my account name was Equin Oxide, and you tried to send something to me, it would end up going to somebody else. So let's say I put title, hi, and then I sent a message and said, uh, I'm a big fan. So let's say I did that. And I was sending it to this person who is me. Well, let's say I was sending it to a friend or someone else that I know. Um, you just say send and it would just instantly send to their mailbox. They'd get it when they came in to the game and whatnot. If you were going to send them an item or money, you could click on open inventory and you can select it. And it'll put it down there in the little box. Um, same thing would go for if you're sending them like currency. And send them currency as well with an item or just currency if you want but yeah this is important it can only be the account name it can't be the name of the individual's character that doesn't work at all 
So you could end up sending items and stuff to somebody that you don't even know because you get you sent it to you sent it to the person's name and that person's name might be someone else's account. So make sure if you send mail, you're only sending mail to the account name, not to the actual character's name. And that's how mail works. Um, the auction house is a little bit confusing maybe at first for some, but it's not for everybody. If you go in here, you have the buy tab and you have the sell tab. In the sell tab, you can list up to 10 items. That's the max that they allow you to do. And when you go to list it, you'd come into this page, you'd click on this button, you'd find the item you want to list and you'd click on it. And then you price what you want for this item. Let's say that you're trying to list 10 items at once. Let's say you have 10 ore and you want to list all 10 items. There is no option at this current time to select I want this much for each ore and you can buy one at a time or you can buy the full stack. The way it works is they have to buy all of them regardless and you have to put the total you want for it. So you're going to have to do some mathematics yourself if you want to figure out what the price might be. So let's say I was to list, uh, I don't know, none of this stuff has like quantity. But let's say I had like some ore, like I said, and there's 10 of them and I wanted to list them for 150 a piece, you'd have to do the mathematics with a calculator or in your head for what 150 gold, or, or not gold, sorry, 150 rubies times 10 would be. And then you would type in the price, you know? And then you'd say sell. And it would cost you a tax right here for how much uh, the auction house is gonna charge you to list the item. So let's say, you found something rare and you think, man, I'm gonna list like this for a million rubies. If you listed it for a million, it's gonna car it's gonna charge you 10,000 rubies. If you're gonna list it for 10 million, it's gonna cost you 100K. And if you're gonna list it for 100 million, which is actually the price limit that the auction house can do, it's gonna cost you a whole million rubies just to be able to list it because it charges a tax. Also, there's also a tax that you get when somebody buys your item as well. So you don't even get the full amount. So if I was to put in like a hundred thousand, or sorry, if I was to put in like a hundred mil, you would maybe get like 95 mil or something because there's a tax limit, uh, or I should say there's a tax on the, the, the person buying your item too. So. If you really want all of your rubies worth and you don't want to get taxed, there's also the option to one-on-one -on -one trade. And there's also like a trade chat inside the Discord channel. So if you want to join the Discord channel on Hero Siege, you can join the trade chat as well. There's also the option to try to do trading from in the game. There is a trade tab right here. And you can try to, uh, you know, say like want to buy, want to sell or whatever um and type in the item name and see if somebody messages you nobody really does that this game's not big enough to do trade in in the chat but you could try I'm not saying it doesn't work um the option to mute the chat is an option too i tend to not have general open uh very much i don't like to see some of the toxic chats that's going on while I'm playing and or while I'm streaming on Twitch. So I tend to turn that off a lot of times. There is the end game chat. If you happen to play with friends, you can always type to them, hey, I found this. And then you can put like an item in. Um, if you ever want to link an item in chat to like a friend, you can hold shift and do left click. And then you'll see that the item appears right here in the chat and you can just highlight it with your cursor so it makes it really nice to show off your item to a friend or something this does not work in the general chat so you cannot highlight stuff and show it off in the chat you can only do it from in game guild chat is also an option uh if you're in a guild with a bunch of friends even if they're in a completely different surfer than you 
if as long as long as they're in sorry not server as long as they're not in a different server and they're in the same region you can still talk to them so let's say you're all in like east or you're all in europe or you're all in australia you guys can still do guild chat with each other it just won't work if one person's like in a different region um as far as general goes um, I believe there is a way to uh, mute specific individuals by doing like slash mute and then their name if they're hassling you and you don't want to see them talk in chat or something. I've never personally done it, but I heard that's an option. If you want to invite somebody to your guild, you can say slash G invite and then their name and it'll invite them to your guild. Um, they have to be in the lobby to do that though. So you need to do it from in-game and they need to be in your lo in the lobby waiting for the invite. If you want to invite them to join your game because let's say you forgot uh, your password or something and you can't give it to them, you just do a slash invite and then their name and it'll find them on the list and then you can uh, invite them that way. Um... So yeah, those are the options I know about in here. I don't think there's many more that I can tell you about right now. But if I do find more later, I can tell you guys about it maybe in the description below. Um, so that's chat. Um, you can choose to do different options with it. You can go into here and, and change the settings a little bit. You can have it fade out faster. You can have it fade out almost never. You can have it more like transparent or less um so yeah that's that there's also combat text and this is when you're doing fighting and damage and stuff so you can change the colors to make it whatever you want uh these just happen to be probably what i have or what the basic is i didn't really change it too much from what it is from the default however I do recommend turning damage and XP and all that stuff off because the more that's going on on the screen, the more lag you're going to see. So if you want to turn off a little bit of the options, doing that will actually help with some of the lag. Um, there's also some stuff like fancy lighting and all that stuff you can turn off if you want. You can change the way that your minimap looks on the screen, uh, the colors that you'll see in the minimap and whatnot. That's up to you, the darkness. Um, you can change your field of view of the screen. Um, you can show the HUD border if you want or turn it off. Uh, DPS meter. So DPS meter is something that allows you to kind of see the general amount of damage you're doing. So if you want, you can come over to a decoy like this in town. You can do like reset to show what it's at currently. Um, this is how much damage I'm pretty much averaging. It will never ever be accurate, but it, it is pretty realistic. As far as if somebody asks you how much damage you're doing, they're going to ask you based on this DPS meter. And what you need to do to get the most accurate is you'll have to right or left click this and you'll have to say reset every time. That'll be where you're most accurate as, um, as far as starting damage goes. Uh, if you want this to be accurate while you're running around outside of in different maps, you want to make sure you have reset outside combat checked. That means every time you walk into a new map, it should reset the DPS meter for you. And uh, locking it literally makes it so you can't move it. So it'll keep it on the screen wherever you lock it. I tend to not do that, but... I also tend to not have the DPS meter on my screen at all times. It distracts me, so I tend to turn it off. Um, show boss cooldowns. You're not going to see this right away. It's only during bosses. But what this allows you to do is see when a boss is about to spam an ability. And it shows you the cooldown on it and all that other stuff. It does come in handy if you don't know any of the mechanics or don't know what to, to watch out for. However, I do not use this either. I usually have it always turned off because I kind of know what I'm doing. It's been, you know, 10 seasons. I should know what I'm doing by now. Um, you can turn off some of this stuff over here. Vibration if you're using a controller or you can keep it on. Screen shake if you don't want the screen to shake during animations. 
Uh, you can also turn off teammates' projectiles. This does not exactly work. If you're playing with a friend, you're still going to see their projectiles. It's just going to help with some of the clutter. It turns off some. It doesn't turn off all. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much the basics of the options. When you go into the in-game settings, though, there is one other thing I'll show. There's auto pickup. I do recommend that you have this on. This makes it so that certain ground items will get picked up when you run over it, so you don't have to actually hit the F button to pick it up. And then there's also loot filter. So as you're running through, if you decide, man, there's just too much clutter on the ground, I don't want to pick up these white items anymore, you can turn it off. You can also say, I want to find white items for rune words later, and I really only want to look for the ones with like sockets that have four of them on it can turn off all of the drops except for the four socket ones and then you can have it selected for commons so that you'll only find the white items and they're only going to have four sockets so you can filter however you want however at the very beginning you don't really need to look for commons uh you want to look for those later in the game because commons for rune words have to be high level they can't be low level so don't worry about that just worry about playing the game, picking up some stuff, figuring out if it's better than what you have, break it down if it's not, so you get gold. And then, uh, you know, you can eventually say, these aren't worth it, I'm gonna take that off, and then keep going. I don't recommend turning off blues and uh, yellows right away, if at all, because gold currency is super valuable in this game. And these two uh, rarities tend to give you the most gold for breaking it. So just continually pick up everything as you go, even if it's way worse than the gear you have, just so you can break it for a bunch of gold. Um, I don't think high monster level prompt is needed, but if you're afraid that maybe you walked into an area that you shouldn't have, this might be a good thing for you. It allows you to have a pop-up on the screen before you enter saying, hey, Warning, this is not safe, um, probably, because even if you are at the point where you can destroy that zone, it'll still pop up and say, hey, warning, this is probably not safe. So it's up to you if you want that on. I don't need it because I know what I'm doing. And then let's go back to this section. Now that we're done with options and shop and all that, there's a vote reset button. What the hell is vote reset? So. Basically, as you're clearing the map, which this is what this is, this is a map device that lets you teleport. Every zone has a little teleport button that you can find and discover, so that you can go back to that zone again without having to run through every single one. So make sure you find those as you go. At the time, there is no experience gain or anything from finding it. I have recommended that they add some type of XP to it or something so that as you guys run through, there is a benefit to finding them early rather than just saying, well, I'm not going to come back here ever again. I'm Once I get to the next difficulty, I'm just going to stay there. Why do I need to find all of them in normal mode? Well, if they actually add a benefit for you to find it, like XP, then there is a reason for you to search them out. So find those if you want. Um, it'll allow you to travel back and forth from town to that spot. Hitting the V button will put down a portal for you, and if you happen to miss out on hitting the portal right, because if you're walking and you hit it, it, it glitches. It won't let you put the portal. You have to stop where you're at to hit it. It only takes like a second, so don't worry about dying. You'll probably be okay. But uh, make sure you stop what you're doing when you hit the V button. If not, it goes on a 10 second cooldown and you can try again. And then the portal will stay there permanently unless you try to place another one. So if you put down a portal, the portal will always bring you to the nearest town in that act. And then you can always go back through that portal to get back to that zone again. So technically these aren't needed unless you hit the vote reset button. Which what that does is it will refresh all of the maps. So let's say you cleared these like five zones all the way up to where the boss is at the end of the act. Let's say you did that, and you're like, man, I don't think I'm ready to move on to the next act. It just seems too hard. How do I just get XP so that I can keep going back 
and like get ready what you can do is you can hit the vote reset button and when you hit the vote reset button it just basically respawns all the mobs and everything in each of the maps and it will respawn the boss again this doesn't make it to where it's not cleared for you anymore it just makes it so you can farm it over and over and over again it also regenerates the map in a completely different generation so each time you go into one of these maps it's going to be different it'll never be random it's, it's always randomly generated it'll never be generated the same so make sure that you don't vote reset if there's something that you wanted to go back to grab so let's say you get up to like dark woods right here and there was something you really wanted to do back at the first zone of outskirts of Anoya, but you're like, I don't think I was ready for that. Um, or uh, there was an item I wanted to grab, but I was I had to think about it. I don't didn't know if I wanted to pick up that relic or something, but now I think I want it. Like you can go back to get it. Um, the instance doesn't change as long as you don't vote reset. Um, so just remember that as you're moving forward. Vote reset also saves your life in hardcore. So let's say uh, you are getting surrounded and you're like, man, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And you're like jumping all over the place and you're trying not to get hit. And you're like, I think I'm going to die. This is this is stupid. You can hit escape and hit vote reset like instantly. It'll take you to town and you're not going to die. If you're not fast enough, yes, you're going to die. <laughs> also, one other thing. If you're playing with your friends at all, let's say you have friends, congratulations, you have friends. Let's say you're playing with your friends and you're in a sticky situation and you want to vote reset too. It'll pop up here on the top of the screen and say vote reset um, by your name and your friend also has to hit vote reset. If he does not or she does not or they do not, you are stuck in vote reset mode and you literally have to wait for them to do it. If they don't, then you're just kind of, you know, screwed. You might as well hit the vote reset button again and cancel it. That way you can hit the save exit button. If you hit the save exit button, it takes you out to the lobby. That way you can at least, you know, save yourself the death. Um, there's also one other thing about vote reset and I'll show you that in a second. So let's go out to the next zone and I'll show you basically one negative to vote reset. So if you're with your friend and you wanted to go through, um, let's say a portal back to town, if you hit the vote reset button, it will no longer let you go through the portal. It'll just have the vote reset up here on the top while you wait for your friend. And it won't let you go through the portal. Even if you spam it or you go over here, like vote reset stops you from leaving the map. You're, you're pinned in that zone that you have vote reset going. So make sure that if you're playing with friends, um, if you have a uh, problem with going through a portal or something, it's not because you have vote reset activated. So that's something I wanted to point out. If you get stuck for any reason where you can't go through a portal or something, it could possibly be because of vote reset. Let's go back to town. So there's the option to go into the journal inside of the escape button zone. That's what you call this. It's a zone, right? On the page where you hit escape, there's a journal. Click on the journal and you'll see where all the rune words are in this game. Uh, what are rune words? I did make a tutorial on this too. However, um, you don't really need the tutorial anymore because they fixed it to make rune words pretty self-explanatory. So let's say, for example, you're looking through these and you're like, man, I don't even know what to make. Like, what's good? Like, how hard is it to make this? these items? Like, it's just too much to take in. I have no idea. I can tell you right away there are a couple that you can make early on that will help you as a new player if that's something you're interested in. So there are options that you can wear these rune words at level one. This one's an example, it's called quick steps. And if you ever want to see what they look like, you just double click on it. So this is 
what quick steps look like. They can be made at level 1. They don't require any specific item level or uh, level requirement or quality. However, the higher the item level and the higher the quality, the higher the stats are going to be when you upgrade them and use them. And even at level 1, they'll be better than most of the drops you're going to find going forward until you get really good drops. So quick steps can be made early. So in order to make them, what you need is to find uh, the base item, which you can see right here. It shows you all of the base items you can use to make quick steps while just highlighting it. And uh, as far as I can tell, that's pretty much all the boots in the game. So it should just say boots. It doesn't even need to have all these names, but I guess they just added it like this on purpose so that you guys know like specifically which ones you can do it has to be a common so they have to be a white piece it can't be a blue orange yellow or purple item or a satanic or anything higher than that which is what you'll find later um it has to have two sockets and the reason the way you know that is based on how many jewels or runes that it asks you to put in so this shows that there's four, this shows that there's two, this shows that there's three, this shows that there's five, this shows that there's six. So this is how you know how many sockets the gear needs in order to make the rune word. And then you go from left to right when you're putting in the runes to, to actually get the rune word to be correctly made. So make sure when you're making like quick steps you put the Zeo and you put the Kui rune uh, from left to right, so Zeo and then Kui, and it'll make the rune work. Um, some people freak out, they're afraid that they're going to put them in in the wrong order. One of the ways to make sure that doesn't happen, if at all, is to take your runes that you have on you, store them all inside of your stash, and then pull out one rune at a time. So here's the rune section. You would pull out, let's say, a, a Zeo rune and have it right there. And then you would go to your base, which, for example, this is a base. But you'd only need a two socket. If you had anything over a two socket or anything under a two socket, it will fail. So you'd put in the Zeo rune by doing right click and socket. And then you'd hit the Zeo rune and put it in. It'll sound like that when you do it. And then you would right click it again and put in the Kui rune. And then once you're done, the item will convert itself into a rune word. Does the base item stats matter whatsoever? No, the whole item gets completely converted and every single one of the rune words will look exactly like this. There is a chance that they will roll a bonus ability somewhere on the item and you'll see it with a green text if it does get a bonus however um i don't know if all of them can and i don't know if uh it makes a huge difference to you but as far as the rune word goes they all roll the same some of them however will roll a different type so for example let's say i wanted to roll um, what's a good example? Ravager. So this one right here doesn't tell you that it rolls a specific element, but every time you roll this, it'll roll a different element. So you kind of have to keep making them until you get the one you want. So if you end up picking like the Nomad where you use sand, then you'd want to look for like a wind um, element one. You end up using a character that uses physical like the demon slayer or the Vi or the viking you can go with physical the viking can also go cold so you could go for a cold one or if you go for like samurai he'll use physical as well um if you go for let's say the paladin you could go for a lightning one so you know what i mean you got to try to find the one that works for you and some of them roll random like that um, same go for books. The Preacher is one that you can get at level 100. It's pretty easy to make. And this one will roll all of the caster type skills as far as damage goes. 
So you could roll wind, magic, uh, electric, poison, um, cold. So depending on which cast you're, you're using, you, you would look for the one that works best for you. And it might take a couple rune words of crafting to find the one you want. But don't, don't worry too much if you don't end up getting it early on. There is the option to check the auction house and see if somebody's selling one in here. Um, the auction house also has um, a filter section, so you can go into that and you can you can check it out. You can look up um, items by how many sockets they have. You can look up by type. Um, you can look up by weapon type specific if you want. You can look up damage type. You can look up resistance type. You can look up quality type. You can look up rarity type. And then you can also go into the sorting section. You can look by lowest price, highest price, unit lowest price, unit highest price, lowest quality, highest quality, lowest rarity, highest rarity. So those are all options in here that you can do if you want. And yeah, go, go ham in here, figure out what you're looking for. Let's say you were doing a rune word, you would want to go to types and you'd want to go all the way down to like runes. And then I like to search by highest price and then say search. And then it'll show me at the top what the highest one is going for. And then if I scroll all the way down, maybe it will hit a section where it stops or maybe it won't hit a section where it stops. But you could do um, lowest price next if you want see where the lowest one is you can scroll down until it starts getting higher and higher and higher and figure out where the midpoint is the thing is though is the auction house doesn't show all of the items you can't just sit here and scroll forever through the items so make sure if there's something specific you want you look it up in here so let's say i was looking for like a hell rune I can look it up specifically like that and then I can scroll through the hell runes and see like if any of them are worth buying probably look for the lowest price like I did so yeah that's how that works this board right here is something that you'll unlock after you beat hell mode um, in hell mode there is a zone over here which is called Valhalla and Valhalla is in the new DLC that you can buy um, off of Steam. Once you've beaten uh, Odin who is the boss it will unlock that board for you and it will allow you to do daily quests for currency and for XP. Um, you'll find that when you're running around there's random mobs that have like a green name and they're a lot harder to kill and they might do more damage to you. Those are part of the quest line that comes with this board, this bounty board. Um, they're not necessary. You don't get achievements or anything for doing it. It's only It only allows you to do two of them a day. And I don't think that they're worth it. I think that um, as far as me making this video right now, they need improvements significantly to make most of us players want to do them. Because by the time that you get this unlocked, you're already achieving way more XP and getting way more currency by doing way different things. There's no reason for us to have to go and do these specifically because they're all like hunting. It's like go out and find this enemy and you go and you farm that zone over and over until you find that guy. It's, it's pretty much a hunt. And you get almost nothing out of it while doing it. Like the, the reward for doing it is insignificant for how much you have to do to try to get one of these quests done. So this needs to be improved. Um, hopefully, when you're watching this video, it's been an updated system. But currently, at this time of me making this video, it's pretty much obsolete. I, I would say just, you know, ignore that. <laughs> it's not worth it. Um, in the options you have uh, a mini map right here 
you could always hit um well for me i have it set up so it's my mouse three button so if you hit mouse three it switches between the mini map in the corner to the map in the middle of the screen you can use your scroll wheel to make it bigger if you want you can also go into your map options and fade this out so that it's really faded in the background and just leave it while you run around um, there's also the option to hit the mouse button and drag it wherever you want just by holding down mouse three you can move it um it doesn't seem to stick in that spot though but i guess it allows you to move it freely for some reason um i don't like this option so i tend to turn it off and i keep the little mini map up here and then if I ever want to see the middle one, I hold tab. So, that's something. So as far as I know, um, emotes are not really needed for anything. They're all just for fun. So if you go into your escape option, there are an e there is an emote section, and uh, feel free to you know use them if you want. Most of them are pay to win, so you have to buy them. So I think you get this uh, thumbs up for free, and then this one that I have I think was gotten through doing some beta testing. But yeah, most of this is uh, pay to win. If not, maybe this came with the Valhalla update. I'm not sure. But yeah, you could use them if you want by clicking R. And I feel like it's only needed if you're doing like multiplayer because outside of multiplayer, who's going to see it? <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and talk about, you know, moving on into the game. Let's say that you're running around outside and you're starting to take through the zones and kill mobs and level up and all that good stuff. And right now you'll notice that this looks a little bit different. It's because I swapped my character. I'm using a character now on local that I have max leveled. That way I can showcase things a little bit faster it doesn't look slow-mo for you. Um, you'll notice these breach portals, you'll find them occasionally um, as you're running around. Be careful, it spawns tons of mobs. They're, they're, they'll leap on you quickly, but you might have a chance to find battle fragments. And those battle fragments are something that will allow you to do end game. Um, technically, once you collect 50 of them, you can move on and go through this portal to another section and that section is called uh, Eternal Battlefield and there's a boss called Sung Lee there who is actually really hard but he has a chance to drop endgame chase items or heroics is what we call it and that section is monster level 1000 for right now so keep that in mind if you decide to try that you have to be in hell mode you have to have 50 of the fragments. So if you run into this, you'll notice mobs just start piling out. It's uh, as if you opened up a different uh, dimension. Um, I hope that the lag in this game actually gets fixed because uh, currently there are some issues with lag. Like it's new this season. It wasn't in the game before, but for season 17, there's some issues with lag. Um, this is also hell mode right now that I'm in, so you're going to see a bunch of drops all over the place from the mobs. So after you clear all that, you'll notice some of them drop battle fragments. You can run over and pick that up. If your screen gets cluttered like this and you're like, man, there's just too much, I don't want all that. Like I said, you can go to the end game, you can turn off commons, you'll notice all the whites drop, like, basically dropped out. Go into here, you turn off blues. All of the blues are gone. You can also do all the other ones. You can say I don't want any of those, but just the purples. There's purples, they'll stay there. You can pick up your fragments. 
And then also, you heard it and you saw it. There's an item that dropped right here. This is considered a satanic. And satanics are something that start dropping once you get into nightmare mode. They will be ranged between tier um, B, A, and S. I'm, I think there might still be some C tiers. I don't know for sure. But if there are, they're found in nightmare mode only. You won't find those in hell mode. And yeah, um, they're not that common, luckily. B, B tiers seem to drop more frequently, and so do A tiers. So if you find a C tier, it's probably not going to be great, and you can just break it down for some rubies. Every time you break down a satanic at the merchant at town, they, he gives you rubies based on the tier level. He'll also give you a little bit more if you happen to upgrade it, which you can do by right-clicking, and you can say upgrade which will allow you to spend the currency to upgrade it. If you happen to be uh, with a bunch of tokens, which is something you'll get later, if you happen to have a bunch of tokens, you can right click the item and you can say, I wanna use an upgrade token. And there's also the option to reroll the quality later. And I'll explain that in a second. So that's what it sounds like and what it looks like if you were to pick up um a satanic there's also ore and this is something that you can get while you're running around doing the mining quest and then continuing on so that you can upgrade your mining level and eventually your jewel crafting level so to get your mining level up you start off by mining copper it says right here by highlighting it it takes mining level 125 uh, to get to the iron then it takes one uh 225 to get to the gold then it takes 500 to get to the ruby and then it'll take 750 mining level to get to jade there's also a hidden one that they added that is completely different um it's a new ore and you won't know about that until you get to the jewel crafting and i'll talk about that later too but that requires um uh, mining level 1000 so what you do is you walk up and you hit F, you'll see the, the circle zoom in over and over. You just need to hit it within the green limits. So as long as you hit it within the green limits, you won't fail like that. If you just spam it, you'll probably fail a lot. So eventually you won't. Technically you can just spam it, but it takes longer. So if you're in a hurry, you could just, you know, Hit it by waiting. You'll notice these boxes when you're running around. Um, the gold rimmed ones actually take um, white keys. Just the normal silver keys you'll find on the ground. So that's what that takes. You'll notice I lost one. Lost one again. So you'll find enough keys while running around that you don't have to worry about buying them like I said. But if by chance you do run out of keys and you really want them, you have the option to spend gold at uh, the merchant in town to be able to buy some. You'll find two different uh, statues like this. One of them is like an angel and one of them is like a demon. And the angel one will always give you a positive buff. It's kind of hard to see it, but the buff will always be down here on the bottom. So you can always check to see what it is. And the demon one has a chance to give you a positive or a negative buff. And whichever buff you get from the demon one is always going to be significantly higher than the angel one. There is a way to bypass the effects of the demon shrine and always get positive. And that is to get a relic called Horned Mask. It says, friends with demons. This makes it so every time you get... Uh, one of those shrines it will always give you a positive buff and never a negative one. While running around you'll probably end up finding a blue chest and that blue chest is called a crystal chest and that's where this crystal key over here comes in handy. It's no different from the gold rimmed ones 
except for it tends to give a little bit more currency when you open them like uh rubies besides that it usually doesn't produce higher rng gear or anything but you know it has a chance so opening them is always nice um you remember how i mentioned earlier that uh light comes in handy so for example this item right here um will give you flight it's a um relic and then i have other flight ones like this one this one will allow me to fly too and so those type of things give you a benefit to flight and like i said if there's ground traps like this it actually won't hurt you because you have flight so for some reason i'm hearing it go off and it sounds like it's hurting me but it's actually not hurting me this is weird why is this happening i don't know <laughs> you guys shouldn't be hearing me get stabbed by these spikes but it's not doing anything as you can see to my health bar so yeah weird so that's the benefit of having flight it also allows you to fly over top of gaps like i said so let's see if i can find one really quick if there is any do, 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 do. is there any gaps come on find one already here's one Woo. see even if i jump into it nothing happens because i have flight if i didn't have flight you guys would instantly see my guy explode and then you would see a damage bar pop up over here that would tell you like what i took damage from if you're in hardcore and you're past level five and you die you'll see uh your name pop up in the game in the chat so that's something that kind of sucks is it lets everyone in the in the actual region know that you died and what you died from uh so keep that in mind if you end up dying in hardcore mode You'll get a lot of Fs in chat, probably. Some people being toxic as they are will, will laugh or say you deserved it or you're a noob or something. But, you know, that's just how all games are. So I'm sure you're probably used to that. Up here, as you can see, is your mana gauge and your HP bar. And as you span or as you level your skills, it tells you up right above it how much mana it's going to cost you to use that skill. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but if you can read it, you can read it. Uh, you can also go into here and, uh, you could see what the cooldowns are after you've put in a lot of points. You can see that the more points you put in, the less cooldown it tends to have. So you can spam your, um, points in. If you want to know what this plus number is to the side, that's all talents. So all talents basically just gives you a free point. So let's say you put 20 points into this skill and you're like, man, how do I keep getting this higher? I want to make this more damage. You can stack all talents on your gear, which will then add an extra point to this. So that's what the all talents is. Um, resistances in this game are crucial, but at the same time, they're not. This game is not like Path of Exile. If you've ever played Path of Exile, you know that uh, resistances is one of the first things you need to like max out because you can get one-shotted if you have like almost no resist. In this game, it does it does benefit you late game like that, but early game resistances don't make a huge difference. What actually matters early on is reduction. So in order to get reduction, the best thing you can do is stack armor because uh, armor converts into damage reduction so start stacking armor on your gear you also probably want to have a decent am amount of hp at the beginning so stack stamina and stack just flat hp um, this way if you do take a huge hit you don't get one shot um, you probably want to look for mana gear too so that you can spam your skills more probably want to look for some gear with cooldown reduction on it so that you don't run out of cooldown you can spam your skills more because you have high cooldown reduction you might want mana per hit or life per hit 
or mana per second or health per second on some of your gear early on. That way you just keep getting replenished over time and you don't have to worry about uh, wasting potion or whatnot to get it back. And then, uh, you know, anything else is just bonus. Maybe you want lots of movement speed. Uh, movement speed at this current season on season 17 is capped at 385. Uh, it seems pretty low. Hopefully they work on it as time goes on. You know, maybe in your current season, if you happen to be in season 18 or 19 or whatever, and you're watching this video, hopefully it's higher. <laughs> if it goes lower, then rest in peace. I'm sorry. It, it kind of sucks as is. So, um, Magic Find, uh, that's something that you'll need to look at later on. It won't help you that early on in the game, but there are cap limits. So, once you hit, like, 500 you'll notice a, a bigger difference on drops once you hit like 1100 you'll see another big jump once you hit 2200 you'll see another big jump and supposedly right now 3000 is the cap so anything over 3000 is just not gonna benefit you at all so trying to stick below that if you really want to run a magic find build uh, block and dodge is pretty significant um, even early on it can keep you from even taking a hit so you can you can stack that if you want um, the cap limit is 85 percent so 100 percent isn't a cap you'll still have a 15 percent chance to take a hit no matter what but 85 percent is really really high chance to not take a hit so you'll notice it all the time that you're not even taking damage if you happen to get at the max um, as far as reductions go Things change every season, but currently in season 17, I would say that moving forward um, from nightmare to, oh, or sorry, from normal to nightmare, I'd probably have around maybe a thousand or more reduction before moving forward. And then before going into maybe like nightmare five, which is probably where most of you are gonna grind before you move to hell mode. And the reason I say that is there's a huge significant jump from nightmare to hell mode so don't just jump into it make sure you're at least like in the high level 80s or 90s first and you have a decent amount of reduction so basically for moving to nightmare one to like nightmare five i'd say having somewhere between like five to six thousand reduction is pretty safe you could probably run around in that and not die um, you'll probably also want to raise your resistances because when you scale the difficulty meter it actually gives you negative resist every point you put up so you're going to need a decent amount of resistances on your your gear and or put gems or whatever you can runes um, leveling up your your gear will help raise the resist a little bit too um, finding um, all resist actually on gear will raise all of the resistances so finding all resist helps a lot um so yeah that's something you'll have to worry about as you go along At the very beginning in normal mode and nightmare one you probably don't have to worry about that that much um from moving on from nightmare five to hell mode currently i'd say somewhere around like 7k to 10k damage reduction seems reasonable um, if you want to be safe, you can totally go there earlier. If you think like, screw that, uh, I'm playing softcore, who cares if I die anyway? I'm just going to run in there and try to level up quick. Go for it. In hardcore, I don't recommend. <laughs> so that's somewhere where I would be around the 7k to 10k range as far as reduction when moving on to hell one. Um, scaling up, I'd probably do um, 10,000 each. So let's say Hell 1 is 10k, Hell 2, 20k, Hell 3, 30k, 40k, 50k, you know, as you go up. Um, like I said, that's the safe option, the safe route that I would take. Um, and that's how I would judge it. You can see I'm at 59k. I'm just running around in Hell 1 though. You don't really have to go higher than Hell 1 if you don't want. Every single item drops in the game in Hell 1. Anything further than that is just more XP and more magic fun. 
And then on top of that, the enemies scale harder, and that's why you get more um, XP. So if you can clear really high um, difficulties, good for you. You're 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 beating the game on the highest possible difficulty. And currently that's hell mode. I don't know if they plan to add any other modes past what they have now. There used to be other modes in the past and they've taken them out of the game. So who knows what you guys are actually seeing, but for now hell mode 5 is the highest for us. And let's see if there's anything else. Uh, as far as all stats go, if you highlight it, any of these things you highlight in your stat sheet, it tells you what it does. So all stats, if you happen to find that on any of your gear, it just raises your strength, energy, stamina, and armor. Um, attack speed and attacks per second. So these are completely different. It's kind of hard to tell you how they scale, but basically attack speed is... What you'll see on your gear that literally says attack speed percent and attacks per second is literally different as well it'll say like aps and it'll say like 0.50 or whatever which one of these is actually uh more beneficial for attack speed attacks per second is but if you stack enough attack speed percent you will notice a huge difference as well and there is runes and stuff you can add and jewels later that will increase your attack speed percent and possibly your APS as well. So I think the limit is around 5.0 as far as I've been told uh, for this season. Anything higher I think might be diminishing. It might not actually add up. So keep that in mind when trying to make an APS build. And... Elemental damage is scaled differently now as well. Um, some classes seem to benefit from it and others don't. So keep that in mind when trying to build your character. Elemental damage might not seem to actually help that much like it used to. Elemental damage used to mean all of the elements. So you might, if you stacked elemental damage in the past, it might have meant you got tons of lightning damage or tons of wind or tons of cold, depending on your class and what it uses. Now, elemental damage scales differently. So keep that in mind. Uh, you might not want to build any elemental on your guy because you might notice it doesn't work. Um, crit damage and crit chance is always an, a great option for every class. Uh, most skills and most left click abilities uh, benefit from crit so you could ma totally make a crit build as you move forward if you want just keep in mind that a lot of the crit gear is less tanky so you're going to go way more glass cannon if you're going to do that so you might have to make up by putting in like runes or gems or, or jewels or something later to be able to make up for it uh as far as flat damage goes most of this doesn't scale with your abilities. Most of this scales with like your left click. And sometimes possibly it'll benefit your relics. I'm not completely sure on that one. But it seems like flat damage, even base damage on your gear seems to mostly just benefit your left click and not your abilities. So I don't know if stacking base damage is worth it guys can figure that out on your own uh, I don't really want to go through all of the testing to figure out if base damage makes a huge difference because from what I can tell you from most of the gameplay I've done you're gonna focus on abilities more than your left click anyway yes APS makes a difference but at the same time they keep trying to nerf it every season into the ground further and further so base damage seems to be not something I'd want to scale as much as I'd want to scale like ability damage or attack power. So yeah, Just so you know, that's something. Um, hero levels. Let's say you hit level 100 and you finally made it on to the next level. Congratulations guys, you did it. So in here there's 10 different options for hero levels and they unlock at the 10 level seg point. So once you hit level 10, you can plug in your first point, then 20, then 30, so on and so forth, till you get to level 100. It's really, really hard to get to, to hero level 100. 
don't assume you're going to make it there in one season unless you just play non-stop. Because the XP needed is significant, and it's going to be kind of hard for you to achieve it if you're just a casual gamer. Um, which ones should you choose for your class? That's completely optional. You can follow one of my guides on YouTube here if you want. I do try to make a guide for every class. I'm still working on it, and I apologize to those of you who have been waiting a while for a certain guide for a certain class. It's been a little bit uh, tedious for me. I try to make things actually work really well before I post a video. So I sit there and I test things and I test things until I like it. Um, I'm not just going to, you know, throw something together real quick just to post it for the views. So some of the classes I'm not happy with what I've been put together yet, so I haven't put together a video, but I'll get around to it when I when I have it, the chance. And uh, so as far as the relic, or sorry, as far as the hero levels go, uh, you're probably going to just want to pick what matches your character the best. So like, I, like you saw and I talked about, strength is attack power, energy is ability power, and H stamina is HP. So if you want your HP to be boosted, go into stamina on the first one. If you want attack power or ability power, this is where you choose these. And then the next one is block chance, dodge chance, and armor. Most people will probably go for armor because they don't have that high of block or dodge chance at the beginning. So it's not going to benefit them as much as having damage reduction. So they'd pick that. And then, you know, moving forward, the rest is up to you. But this is how uh, the hero level system looks. Mercenaries. Mercenaries are huge. So once you guys get to the point where you have uh, 10,000 rubies down here, as you can see, this is in crystal form. So once you have 10,000 rubies, what you'll do is you'll go back to one of the towns. There's three towns that you can buy mercenaries. So the town of Anoya, the one you start in, you can go up to the guy that's by the targets, and he has the option to buy a knight. If you buy the knight uh, mercenary, you can now click the T button, which uh, brings up your player's uh, uh, talent tree, your hero levels, and your mercenary's talent tree. So once you're in the mercenary's talent tree, you can spec it however you want. You can read each skill. Some of them give you benefits for passives, and some of them are active abilities for the mercenary, which go on cooldown, as you can see. Um, what would I recommend for the melee one? Right here, it says Commander's Heart. It gives you and the mercenary health regen. So I would plug in at least one point into that. And then once you go out here and you look, you'll see that uh, you have mending 1%. So mending 1% means that you have 1% health regen now, and it's because of your mercenary that's running around with you. If you happen to go back into the tree and plug in this aura expert, so if you spam it, let's go 20 points. The way that these point system works is the same way your talent tree works. So the mercenary gets 100 levels for points, and you get 100 levels for points. That's how it works. So every level you level, your mercenary also gets a level. And it just converts over. So if you happen to get your mercenary at level 60 or something, your mercenary will automatically be level 60. So now that you plugged in 20 into here, and you have 1 into here, if you go over and look at mending, now it says mending is level 22. So you're getting the benefit of having 22% health per second compared to uh, just the 1% you had when you put in one here. Um, I don't know if there's a point to spam like extra extra health into here, but it might actually benefit your mercenary more than it benefits you if you actually put more points into this. So if your mercenary seems to be having problems surviving, Go ahead and plug in more points into here for health regen. Over here, um, there's some other options that are really nice with this character. I like to focus on stuff where he can stun the enemy. This makes it so that the enemy stops attacking for a second. 
especially if like a boss is trying to use an ability on me that might hurt really bad. If he has a chance to stun the boss, it'll cancel out the boss's ability. So I'd put at least one into anything that says it can stun. Um, if you want to have it to where your mercenary takes less damage in general, you can stack stuff into damage return. So if your um, mercenary gets surrounded by like five or more mobs and they're all hitting him, a lot of the damage that they do to him will be returned. So you can stack into like the damage return option. If you want your mercenary to take aggro a lot, you want to put into the taunt. So feel free to plug points into taunt. Um, the more points you put in, the more targets he can taunt at once. So this might be a really good idea for somebody who's trying to aggro the whole screen. Um, keep in mind though, the taunt beams that sh shoot off of your mob are very... Uh, I guess they, they have a specific distance they can shoot. So they're not going to go screen or, or map wide. They're probably going to go screen wide. So anything within the screen might get taunted, not the whole map. Uh, besides that, most of the skills on here seem to benefit the mercenary more than they benefit you. So feel free to plug in like life per hit for the mercenary so he can get his health back quicker. Um, feel free to put other things in that might improve. Like this says it helps it, it give the chance to taunt as well. Um, this has a chance to knock back and slow enemies. Uh, this makes it so that uh, it can throw long distance attacks and not have to be point blank. This has a chance for the mercenary to go into like a rage mode and apply armor break. So if you want like it to apply more break on the target, you can stack more points into that. And then, you know, the rest is up to you. So feel free to plug in what you want. Um, the things I would say that are most important are the ones that benefit you as a player. So like I said, getting yourself health regen is pretty nice. And then after that, you can stack in the skills that you want. I try to put one point into all the passives. So if it says it has a passive ability, I put at least one into it. That way it's always going for the mercenary. And then after that, you can plug in as much points on... Uh, the actual active skills as you see fit. So that's the mercenary that's the knight. If you want to move on to the next mercenary, you'll find that in Act 3. That's in Moss Arathim. So up here at this um, NPC, you would find the archer. Once you buy the archer, he has a completely different skill tree as well. So let's let's go ahead and reset his talent tree. And the one thing that's cool about him is he might not give a HP buff where you're getting health regen, but instead he has a skill that gives him a chance to give you attack speed boost. So you could plug in a bunch of skill points into that, or you can just put in one point, just like we did on the other one, and then we can go and raise our aura. And then if we go over here, you'll see that we have a 23% fantasism bonus and it's permanently active. So you'll have like a attack speed buff with this uh, mercenary, unlike the health one. Let's see what happens if we stack more points into that. Did not change anything. It still says 23%. So I think that maybe plugging in more points into this is giving more to the mercenary than it is you. I'm I'm honestly not completely sure. Uh, this is something we'll, we'll figure out more as we move forward. But it seems like you at least need one point into the attack speed buff. And then up the aura so that you get the majority of the benefit from it. Um, everything else in here seems to be going more towards uh, the mercenary. This skill right here though says that it increases the mercenary and the player's life per hit. Uh, it doesn't seem to work for me. I tested it, I didn't see any benefit to it. But moving forward, hopefully they fix it to make it work for you and for me. Um, so that could be really good, it increases life per hit. Maybe it's just a chance, but it doesn't say that there's a proc chance. So 
stacking into that would be potentially really well like good for you and everyone else besides that just put one in every single passive um, this one seems to be pretty good it has a chance to break the enemy's resistance so I'd probably stack 20 into that so that it breaks their resist and you do more damage as a player and yeah moving forward just plug in what sounds good to you and that's for sure the ones that I would plug into for this class. And this is located in Moss Arthim, the third act. Moving forward from there, there is one more mercenary, and it's found in the Dawn's Chapel, which is at the beginning of Act 6. And this is a caster. So come over to Sister Mary over here, and then you can hire the mercenary, which is the mage, which is a caster. And then you can open up its skill tree. Let me reset that. So there's a couple things that's really good about this mage. Um, first off, if you're playing in hardcore, you might be interested in the Ward of Protection. The, the Ward of Protection is a shield that your mercenary will apply to you um, quite often, actually. It says it's a 5% chance, but I'd say it's more of like a 20% chance and it happens quite often and it pretty much will just apply a bubble shield over you i wouldn't i wouldn't just put one point into it to be honest you could you could just put one point and then max out the auras and i don't know i i'd say that just to be safe if you're going for um, the benefit of having this shield, I would just max it out just in case because it says on here absorption and even if uh, Even if the absorption doesn't get applied to you and it applies to your merc 72% to absorb an attack sounds like he's not gonna die almost ever so just go ahead and spam like all the points into that the next uh, ability up says that the mercenary has a chance to reset the player's cooldowns, which makes them go straight to zero. So basically, if you have a skill where you could technically use it twice in a row and it stacks, this is very, very helpful. It allows you to actually get your ability to appear twice. Um, this is something I'm taking advantage of while I can, and I recommend the same for you guys unless you're going for like i said a health regen or an attack speed build because this is not that this however does give you other options too like right here you can max out how much mana you have so by hitting this you're gonna get more mana constantly while it's going up so if you're running having problems with mana you can boost your mana using this perk and then right here the mercenary has a chance to give you mana regen too. So if you, you're having problems with mana regen, feel free to max out that so that your character just has constant mana regen coming in. It's only a chance, but it, it tends to happen a lot more than 5% of the time. After that, the rest I would just plug in however you want. Um, plug in every passive, like I said. Um, there's also two really good skills right here. Uh, these I also recommend maxing if you guys want or plugging in or swapping stuff around if you want maybe you're not having issues with mana so you don't need that so instead you would rather plug in mercenary has a chance to buff a po ability power so if you want your abilities to do more damage you can always stack points into these that way the mercenary has a chance to buff your abilities um, the rest, like I said, just is dependent on how you want to build the mage. It's just mostly attacks for the mage. It has nothing to do with you. So yeah, I really like the mage out of the, the three options. This one tends to benefit you, the player, the most. Unless, like I said, you really need health regen or you really need attack speed. Um, so yeah, there you go. There's the three mercenaries. How to get them. If your mercenary actually dies, um, they'll just poof off of you completely. Um, in order to get them back, you'd come back to the NPC that you had bought them at originally, and they will give you a price in gold on how much it'll cost you to buy them back. 
to keep in mind you want to gear them as you go so they don't die in order to do that you click c you click tab and then they have their own gear sections they have a weapon section a shield section a helmet and a body armor you can put in what you want um just try to make them tanky at the beginning if you can or um, you could put magic find or XP items on them. Magic find and XP actually transfers over to the player. So if you have a bunch of magic find items on your mercenary, you get the benefit. If they have a bunch of XP items, you get the benefit. Besides that, none of the items give you the benefit unless it's a rare item. Such as like this, this is considered a heroic. When they drop, they have a completely different sound than satanics. Um, that's what it sounds like if you drop a chase slash heroic item. If you drop an angelic item, that's what that sounds like. There's also a couple other things that sound angelic. Um, there are these keys that drop in the game, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, those are something you'll find only in hell mode. There are also something new called a bifrost key and that uh, also drops and sounds like an angelic uh normal satanics you already know what it sounds like and then everything else just sounds the same nothing else has a, a specific sound on it not even these set pieces um every single class has its own set most of, no every single class has two sets now and they all sound just like satanics when they drop. Each boss that you kill from the axe all have at least one set as well. And they just sound like normal satanics too. This one dropped off of Satan off of Act 6. So that's something. And then, uh, yeah, you could see that there's a difference in colors. So this is what an angelic looks like. It's, it's yellow. Satanic is red or green. And cyan like light baby blue is the heroic slash chases why do we, we call them chases back in the day we they didn't they didn't call them heroics they were called chases because nobody knew where they were found the idea was you chased around you were chasing to see who could find it first so everybody was running around collecting them and for some reason they decided they didn't like the name chase and they changed it to heroic so if you hear me say chase a bunch, that's why. Alright, so let's go ahead and talk about jewel crafting. Once you guys get to Act 4, after beating Anubis at Act 3, there will be an NPC right here, and he is the jewel crafter. Click on him and grab the quest line. His quest line says, I want you to prospect ore. This doesn't actually mean go out and mine ore. A lot of people get this confused. Instead, click on him and you'll see where it says prospect copper ore. So as long as you have 10 copper ores, you can prospect the 10 that he asks for on the quest. Um, for some reason it won't let me type anything. So I guess we'll just scroll. Let's just do 15. That's easier to scroll to than 10. All right, so you see that we got materials. The materials come down here on the bottom. And we don't have enough to be able to make anything. So you'd probably have to prospect more. Let's go ahead and prospect some more anyways. Let's do like around 200-ish. We got some more materials. All right, looks like... We unlocked enough to be able to do some bronze frames. And if you look over on the side over here, you'll see which ones takes which frames. Uh, it looks like this one takes bronze. This one takes bronze all the way down to here. So all of these take bronze. And then you can see that the pattern changed. I know it's a little bit dark, but you'll see that the pattern changed starting here. So this takes silver. Or, and this takes silver over here, all of these ones. And then you can see it changed again, so the gold one is used for just two of them. After that, the rest of these gems, which are considered uniques, 
don't uh, use any of the frames. So as long as you get these materials, which I believe come from mining jade or prospecting jade, you don't need to have the frames for them. However, these materials uh, that craft into these gems only allow you to place one of them on your character at a time. So if you were to put, let's say the angelic one, which the angelic one gives plus two all talents to your character, you can only have one. It won't allow you to put two because if you put two, the second gem does nothing. So it'll be a waste of time if you guys put two of the same unique gem on your character because it doesn't stack. You can have one of every single one of these uniques on because that will actually stack, but you can't put two of the same gem so or jewel. Keep that uh, in mind as you're moving forward that only one unique of each. I'll put a link in the description below, guys, that allows you to bring up actually a full spreadsheet of all the jewels all of the ore conversions into materials and what they do so please feel free to jump down into the description below this video and get yourself well in depth with all the jewel crafting and all the needs so let's go ahead and do some real quick though just so you guys can see so let's go ahead and do some iron see that it made some more materials see that it do some gold made more materials uh, do some ruby more materials and then we'll do some jade all right so now that we did a little bit of all of them you see that we have enough to make at least a couple frames of all we got most of the materials needed to be able to make one of at least the uniques. I don't know if we have enough to make multiple, but at least one of the uniques we can make. Um, it looks like these don't show they're unlocked, but it's because we don't have the frames made. So if you make the frame, let's make one of each. Now they're all unlocked. Except for this one, which looks like what we're missing is the green down here. Um, I guess it's called Jade Geninium, Geninium, or whatever it's called. It's basically Jade Fragment. I'm going to call it Jade Fragment. So you'd have to prospect more Jade to be able to get more of that, which looks like it's pretty rare. Um, so it's like a powder, I guess. Jade powder, not fragment. Screw it, we're doing all of our jade. Still only got two. So yeah, this powder is pretty rare. Um, it's going to take a lot of jade to be able to get it. And so if you really want that plus two all talent gem, you're going to have to prospect a bunch of jade. Besides that, the rest of the materials seem realistically not too hard to get. So... Just collect a couple thousand of each um, ore as you go mining. Or you could buy it up from another player if you want and just prospect it. But as you do it, you'll get your level up. And while you get your level up... Let's turn this quest real quick. We, we, we far succeeded your quest line, sir. So let's go back in. You'll see that right here there's prospect um, terethium. And terethium is the ore that I was talking about earlier that you can mine at level 1000 mining. It is like a blue looking um, stone. And as far as I know, uh, there's no reason to do it. Um, it doesn't seem like there's anything you can use it for. Even if you were to get these rare materials, there's nothing in here that can be crafted using those materials yet. So as far as the game goes in its current state for us, um, Season 17, it seems like there's no reason. Maybe it'll in help increase your mining level? I haven't gotten a chance to mine any yet, so I don't know. So you guys tell me, if you, if you guys know, does it, does it raise your mining level quicker if you mine the new ore? Or is it kind of just a waste of time? However, I'm sure they have plans for it. Um, in the near future, so look forward to using 
Terethium for more things. Um, I'm sure that they have things for it. At least planned, if not already done. They just need to work on it a little bit more. Uh, over here is where you make uh, pristine gems now. So you can craft your gems up from like cracked versions all the way up to perfect versions. And then you take those perfect versions with the materials you get from doing gem crafting and you can make pristine versions. So like I said, all of the materials, what the gems do, um, how to get the materials and whatnot, they're all on the spreadsheet that you can find down below in the description. So there you go, guys. That's how you do jewel crafting. Once you guys get to the point where you're in hell mode, you guys have the opportunity to move forward and start doing some leaderboard climbing. That's where wormholes come in handy. So over here at Dr. Tinkerdink, you could say, hey, I would like to open up a wormhole. It tells you right here it requires level 80 and hell difficulty. So once you hit the level 80 mark and if you enter hell mode, which most of you probably won't enter hell mode at level 80, you'll probably be higher than that. But let's say you do end up in hell mode early because you think you can do it. You can totally try it. Uh, the monster level isn't that much higher than the original level of the hell mode. So what you do is you go over to this portal and you click on it. You'll end up inside the wormhole and each wormhole has its own specific level. There's a timer up here showing you like how much time you have to complete the mob clear. It also shows you the monster level which is about 20 higher than your normal hell one level zone. And then just go for it. Here's the name of the level if you need to know. So let's run through and try to clear out the map. Your goal is to beat it before the timer runs out. Um, if you get any drops like I just did, they will appear at the very end after you beat the boss. You also will notice your XP bar isn't moving. The XP doesn't actually appear until after you've beaten the whole zone and the boss as well. So keep that in mind. You can't just run this over and over again and then vote reset or whatever. Because you won't get any um, XP until after you've beaten the boss. It seems to be a little bit laggy for me, but this might not ha happen for you. Hopefully it's something that uh, gets worked on in the server. So now that we beat all of the enemies, we go kill the boss. There is quite a few different bosses in here. So keep that in mind. The boss mechanics are different between each boss. I do show off quite a few of them in one of my videos that shows off the wormhole bosses. Uh, that might need to be updated because they've added a couple and took out a couple since I made that video. But for the most part, most of them are still in here and they're still significantly different. So take a look at that video if you would like. But yeah, this is how you do wormholes. Once you beat the wormhole, your progression jumps. You can see that the monster level jumped by 20. So it instantly took you to the next difficulty. And uh, depending on which boss you kill, it might change um, how many wormholes you go up. So some bosses are technically a little bit different than others, and it might change your wormhole to be a different level. So right now it says we're on difficulty level or wormhole two. So if we move on to the next one, we notice that it's literally a new map and different mobs. The monster level's 20 higher than what it was, like I said, and you don't get the XP or the drops until after you beat the boss. So let's go ahead and run through this map real quick. And we'll pay attention this time to the XP bar and um, what drops at the end. You notice we still have time on the timer, uh, plenty of it, before we get to um, the boss. Does it make a difference whether or not you clear it super fast or not? No. You don't get more XP, you don't move forward and wormholes farther. It would be nice, 
I feel like as we move forward, they should actually change it so that if you clear the wormhole way faster than the timer, it actually jumps you up to a more difficult area that they feel like will give you a little bit more struggle for the timer. But you know, that's something they can work on as we go forward. So let's go ahead and kill these. All right, we killed it and our XP went up a little bit on its own. And we got the drop. We picked up the stuff we have highlighted, which is only mythics. If you guys wanted, you can go back in here and turn these back on. You can see all the other drops that the boss dropped too, but we had it turned off. So, you know, convenience for you. And there you have it. Difficulty went up again. And now you're like wormhole three on the leaderboard. Hopefully moving through the leaderboards is easy for you, but keep in mind, every boss is different. They have different mechanics. Some hurt really bad. Some bosses you might not want to fight. Some zones you might not want to fight because the mobs are extra hard. It's really up to you guys on how you decide to take on the wormholes. And best of luck on your guys' leaderboard pushes. In many of the zones that you come across throughout the game, you'll find a bunch of these dungeons. In uh, Outskirts of Anoya, there's the Rat Den. Um, in Hell Mode, it will ask you to unlock it for a key and there will be an NPC standing right beside it that allows you to boost the difficulty for a higher reward. I don't think that that's worth it. I, it'll cost you two keys and it'll cost you a bunch of currency to go in for a little bit more rewards. Um, the drop of, of gear that can drop in there doesn't actually get higher if you go to a different, a different difficulty. However, the reward box at the end will offer you a little bit more significant of a reward. Is it worth spending two keys and paying for though? I don't know, that's completely up to you. I guess if you want to boost the difficulty for the XP, you can. However, I probably would not, especially in hell mode, because who wants to join an area that's extra rippy, you know what I mean? So if you're in softcore, maybe it's worth the risk at least once just to try. But there's a timer on it, so keep in mind you have to beat the dungeon within the time limit. And I don't know if that's worth it, at least to me. So certain dungeons have specific bonuses. This one, um, the, the Rat Den, has ore in it. So when you first come into it, um, feel free to come in here just to mine some coppers. Sometimes it might be irons, I'm not sure. But I think that it's always going to be, for the most part, copper. So if you want to get your copper out of the way, there we go, irons. So if you want to get your copper mining out of the way, you can come back here over and over again. Uh, this um, area does have a higher chance to drop runes too. So if you're looking to make like quick steps early on, or even some other unique um, rune words that end up being able to be farmed at level one, for example, Scholar is a helm that you can wear at level one. So if you want to make this early on, you can too. And, uh, you know, just take some of the easy to get runes and a three socket cap or cap or shako. So this is a good place to come for runes early on if you want to farm it over and over and over again. I know you're not going to get lots of XP, it's literally monster level 3, so you're not going to get much XP um, doing it over and over, but it might be good for the mining, like I said, and also if you get this chest, you'll also get some currency, which will be rubies, so you can farm rubies over and over from these chests as well. So, not a bad place to come if you want to do the mining aspect. There's also another place you can go to get your copper and iron up really quick and that's over here in mount fuji if you come to mount fuji there is a dungeon and that's called the crater so if you go to fuji crater this is a really good place to get your mining up as well keep in mind you might get swarmed by these enemies in here so kill them as fast as you can but there's a lot of 
copper and iron in here. So this might be the best place potentially to do your iron farming later on so that you can get to gold. So this, in my opinion, is probably the best place. Come here, do a bunch of mining, get your, your mining level up so that when you get to hell mode, you can start farming ruby ore and jade ore automatically. There's also gold ore once you get to hell mode too, so you could always just farm the gold there, but I do recommend coming to a place like this first and uh, doing the gold and the iron. So when you get to nightmare mode, you can do the iron or the gold farming here. And before nightmare mode, you can get your copper and iron out of the way here as well. So Fuji Crater has like a lot of ore in it. So take advantage of this if you want. There's also one more place before this if you want to go there instead. If you go to Act 4 instead of Act 5, there is Corrupted Cave right here. In Corrupted Cave, there is a dungeon called Abandoned Mine. It, these dungeons don't spawn every time, by the way, guys. But uh, they do spawn quite often. So as you're running around, pay attention. You can see it on the minimap if you find it early. Um, certain zones tend to have more random ores on it too, and you can see those on the minimap. They look like a, a pickaxe, or a mushroom, whatever you want to call it, but I think it looks more like a pickaxe. So, let's run around. The dungeon looks like a, a plus, like a big T, if you find it on the minimap. Do, 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 do. Not finding it. Do, 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 do. There it is. So there's the big plus on the minimap. And... Let's go in to Abandoned Mine. This is another place you can do some mining as well. Um, it's not as much as Fuji Crater, but there is ore in here, so... You could always take advantage of this area too. Whichever one you think is easier, um, you know, you can see that there's mining nodes in here that you can take advantage of. So, another place to come to be able to mine is the old abandoned mine. There's also a box. So, that's... That's, in my opinion, the best places to go if you're going to mine for early leveling up the fastest I can think of. Alright guys, so let's talk about relics a little bit more. Let's say that hypothetically you don't know what relics to choose, or let's say that you end up dying from something and you lose all of your relics. Um, Anything could cause you to die, but let's just say I don't have any relics. So let's reset my relics real quick. Alright, potentially I just died. Let's say I ran over and I tried to make a jump and I didn't make it like that. Let's say I died. Alright, so I died to falling. Woo! My favorite way to die! I didn't have flight. I didn't make it, you guys. Alright, so let's say I need relics really bad. There are a couple areas you can go to farm relics early. Um, one of those areas would be like Pumpkin Patch. In Pumpkin Patch, there is pretty much either going to be a chest or there's going to be a relic at the very end of the dungeon of... Well, you'll see. I will show you. Let's see if we can find the dungeon. There's also another way, if you happen to have a bunch of keys, and you have these boxes, you could always open up all these boxes, and there's a good chance there's going to be relics in it, like this. So, you guys can choose whether or not you want to pick up those. Maybe you'll get lucky and find a flight relic in it. Alright, so here's the dungeon. The pumpkin cellar. Let's go inside. As long as you don't get killed by a trap on the floor, or a bunch of the mobs you can 
get to the last floor and then off to the right right here there's a good chance there's going to be a relic and if there's not there's going to be a box that you need to open with a key so that's one spot where you can farm for relics really easily while you're running through the game another good spot to farm relics is potentially dry hills dry hills is guaranteed there's going to be a relic inside of sand cave if you want to farm that um it's not as good as another zone though that i'm going to teach you about soon enough but it is good so let's go see if we can find dry or the sand cave real quick in the dry hills is there a sand cave there it is all right sand cave let's go in let's just get to the next floor as fast as we can and then let's run straight up the next zone as fast as we can and relic so right here, there's always going to be a relic. Um, if there's not, maybe it'll be a chest, but more than likely it's going to be a relic. So this is another place you can try to farm over and over. If you're looking for that specific relic or you're looking for a flight relic early, it's not a bad place. All right, next. As you're moving forward, there is other dungeons that you can go into. But another one that specifically is really good for getting relics is over here in Act 7. If you go to Event Horizon, there is a very good chance that you might find relics on the surface here. So as you're running through, you might find just random relics offered to you by the zone. And then there's also a dungeon, and that dungeon called Distorted Horizon has a very very high chance that there'll be relics and not just one but multiple so let's keep looking see if we can find the distorted horizon dungeon so far no relics on the surface but there is potential for it so it's not a bad spot to be uh, distorted horizon are you here Keep looking. And I'm gonna say no. There probably isn't a distorted horizon here. We've covered majority of the map and we're not seeing it, so looks like it's probably not in this exact one. And you know that's that's part of the game. It it's randomly generated. So the game sometimes won't generate the the actual dungeon so you just have to run it again and hope that you find it so let me go ahead and uh skip to that i'll do all of the running around real quick and then we'll be back at the actual dungeon all right just like i promised here's a distorted horizon uh let's go ahead and go in there and see if we can find relics so we're going to run, we're going to run, we're going to run. Doesn't matter if you're on normal or nightmare or hell mode. There tends to always be one or two relics right here. So you can pick that up if you want. Um, having flight when coming to this dungeon is actually more beneficial than not having flight. And I'll explain that here in a second by showing you. So moving on to the next area. There is quite a few spots that have a potential to have flight or relics in general. And one of those is right here. So you'd have to jump over like this and pick up this one if you wanted it. This is what pops up, like I said, if you choose to say, are you sure you want it? You could say no or you could say yes. So if I go back into here and I turn off relic confirmation, I won't see that anymore. Jump back over. And then as you continue your way through this dungeon, there's another one to the right, right here. This one, you'd have to jump right here if you wanted it. Or you could go another direction, but I think right here is probably the safest. But then you'd have to jump again 
and I'd say just jump this way straight because you can make it pretty easily. If you're really sketch, you can jump like this, but you know, <laughs> I don't recommend- Oh, that guy hurts. Watch out for those. Those guys spam their guns and it hurts really bad. Don't- don't take- don't face- don't face those things. Try to run away. Uh, there's a chance a relic will spawn over here, or a box. Doesn't look like that did. And then... We will just, you know, clear it. And there's a relic right here that spawned. So, good chance to find relics in here, guys. This is a good example of an active relic. It goes up here. And then when I hit it, goes on cooldown. As you can see, that just drops a dice from the sky that does some AoE damage. I don't think it's a good relic. It could be one that they could potentially make better or just delete completely because nobody uses it. But yeah, that's what an active relic looks like. And I think that this place is probably the best, I don't know, probably the for sure best place to farm for relics. So if you guys are looking for relics, feel free to farm this over and over until you get what you want. However, let me show you guys something. Let's say you guys happen to have a bunch of mining um, ore. Maybe you went out and you were working on your jewel crafting, or maybe you were just working on leveling up your mining. Well, if you die on soft core and you don't have your relics, or if you're still pushing to get all of your relics and you haven't gotten them yet, or maybe you picked up a bunch of bad ones and you're like, man, I just want the best of the best, so I'm going to reset my relics, and you hit the relic button and refresh it. You could come into here, go to craft. Once you have the mining level unlocked, which is literally like, what, 20 coppers or something mined? Go into here, and right here there's an option to craft random relic. So you guys click on it, and it gives you the option to go through and pick ones that you want. If you don't want this one, you could say reroll. If you don't want this one, you can hit reroll, but I'm going to say pick. And it puts it right here on the ground, and you pick it up. See these stats right here? I feel like that should be over top of the relic at all times. It actually used to be like that, so hopefully it's fixed for you guys, and it's just a glitch for me. But yeah, you guys can sit here if you have a bunch of ore saved up, and you could just spam the relics over and over again until you get the ones that you want. It's that simple, it's that easy, it just takes uh, a bit of, you know, ore to do. So, figure out what works best for you. The free method of just running dungeons over and over, or opening boxes and hoping you get what you want. Or, you could end up, uh, you know, just rolling ore over and over. So, whichever works the best for you guys, I hope that you find the easiest method. And uh, let me know how that worked for you in chat, down below. So, some of you guys are always asking me, what do you think is the fastest place to farm so I can get to 100 quick? Well, it's not always as fast for everyone, everybody has their own means of doing it, but I will show you a couple of places I recommend at least trying, and see if it makes it easier for you to level. Alright, so first thing is you'd probably want it to be on Nightmare 5. If you're in Nightmare 5, then you're doing almost as much uh, enemy damage, and the enemies have almost as much HP as, as Hell Mode. So you're getting pretty close to Hell Mode, but you're not quite Hell Mode yet. The resistances are pretty close to the same too, so once you feel super, like, I don't know, confident with Nightmare 5, you could probably move on to Hell Mode. But let's say that you're not confident, you want to gain levels first, and what's the fastest way to gain levels? Well, I would probably continue to grind out Nightmare Mode, obviously. You probably beat it all the way in Nightmare 1 or 2 or whatever first. So once you have all of this done, I would first try going here and running the normal boss dungeon uh, a couple times. See how the clear speed feels for you, and how... Uh, easy it is for you to kill um, Satan over and over again. By doing this you also get quite a bit of rubies, so you get rubies from actually just uh, killing the boss over and over, so that's one thing you can do. Another good place would be to come to the Event Horizon, 
uh, do the dungeon Distorted Horizon. That has uh, a lot of mobs in it. The monster level is over 100. So there's a potential to find one commons that you can use for rune words that are over eye level 100. And two, um, if you haven't gotten all of your relics, this is a good way to kill, you know, multiple birds with one stone. You can farm relics while also grinding XP. It's also technically a dungeon and the dungeons give a uh, way more drop chance towards runes so it's something that you can also uh, count on as you'll end up finding more runes by going into it and then uh, yeah it's a good source of XP because there's a lot of mob clear so distorted horizon the dungeon that's inside event horizon which it seems like we can never freaking find. I don't know why out of all of them this one seems to spawn the least. Alright, here it is. So, Distorted Horizon. Go in there, farm that a bunch of times. That's a really good way to uh, actually get a bunch of XP. Alright, so besides Nightmare, I mean, there is still one other place I can show. Camp of Souls right here is actually a really good place to farm XP. And then also, I'll show one more later, but Camp of Souls is really good XP. Um, you can also get really good XP from farming Chaos Towers and from um, farming uh, Unstable Rifts, which I haven't showed yet, but I will show that here shortly. So Unstable Rifts and uh, Chaos Towers and Nightmare are always really good for XP. So keep in mind when you're going into those, they are meant to be more difficult. So if it is too difficult for you, you can always just leave by doing Vote Reset or Save Exit. Um, they're meant to be higher um, damage and meant to be higher monster level on purpose. It's supposed to be a challenge. So keep that in mind. Um, Camp of Souls in the new um, DLC is actually a really good place to get XP too. It has a lot of mobs. It might be somewhat of a crazy map design, but it is really good for XP. It has quite a bit of uh, ancient mobs, which well, that's one thing that you'll find a lot of here. So it's pretty good for doing the quest line for the ring which is uh, something you guys will run into and I'll talk about here in a little bit. But uh, yeah, if you see the mobs on the screen, the ones with the circle that's gray around the red means they're an ancient mob. So the ancient mobs have a higher job chance for Gragite, which are the fragments I was talking about. So this place is really good for that. Especially if you happen to have uh, max movement speed, it'll make it easier. Or if you do a lot of damage, the mobs will die pretty quickly, comparably. Um, ancient mobs do happen to have a little bit more higher defense, maybe HP, so that it takes them a little bit longer to actually kill. But uh, yeah, this is a really good place to farm XP too. Especially if you happen to be uh, helping boost somebody. Like I was talking about way earlier at the beginning of this video. If you happen to be trying to like boost your friend. Uh, bringing them here in hell mode. Or even Nightmare 5 would be a really good place to try to speed level somebody. If you could do it quick enough. Um, besides Camp of Souls. There is like I said one other place in this area specific. That is really good for XP farming. But that XP farming is more end game. It's not actually XP farming on a low character budget, if that makes sense. Because you're not going to be able to survive. So we'll talk about that here in a second. Let's move on to Hell Mode. Because Hell Mode is where the next XP jump goes. So in Hell Mode, let's put it back on one. In Hell Mode, you can go to Fields of Battle. In Fields of Battle, uh, you can get a bunch of mobs uh, piled up in a big group. If you happen to run around, you don't even have to attack them. You can just get them interested in you. 
you happen to have the Merc that gives Taunt, it'll help even more. You can get them all piled up easier. Um, once you get them all pretty much piled up on the map, you could just sit there and kite them all if you want. It is a really good place to get XP fast because there's a lot of mobs here. So, basically you just run the whole map, you try to pull them all in towards the middle. Especially, like I said, if you have Taunt on a Merc, which the Knight from the very first act tends to have a decent Taunt pull on him. Um, watch out, there is a lot going on though. So, if you're not tanky enough, this might not be a good idea. But yeah, if you can do this, you can see on the map, uh, there's tons and tons of mobs. So if you can get a lot of them pulled into the middle, um, and you can speed kill it, this is really good XP really super fast. So let's say that... You're, do you're not going to be able to do what I'm doing right now. I have endgame gear on. This is just an example. But this is really, really good XP. Um, because there's just constant mobs everywhere. With this many mobs too, it brings the chances of finding good drops up higher. So that's another reason to maybe choose an area like this. Because you're going to be killing more mobs, which potentially means more drops, right? The odds of something dropping go higher if you kill more Id or more enemies. So, more bosses, more enemies equal more drops. Um, faster the better. If you have high magic find, it'll just increase the chance of uh, getting a rare item. It doesn't actually increase the chance of more drops. So, potentially, the more magic find you have, the greater the tier of item you might find, but it doesn't mean that you'll find way more drops. So this is a really good place for XP, the Fields of Battle Act 1 in uh, Hell Mode. But if you happen to travel further, and you're still not level 100, or if you want to grind out hero levels, coming here to uh, um, the Pyramid 1 is actually probably the next best place. Here or uh, health or pyramid too. So there's a lot more mobs as well in these areas. Do 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 do. All right. These ones also have more potential to try to shoot you though. So hopefully you have a little bit of damage reduction when you come to these areas. Um, if you are able to kill the mobs in the Act 2, no problem, then you'll probably have no problem here either. Because the mobs in Act 2 have potential to freeze and whatnot, so watch out for that. Uh, so let's keep going. Unlock more mobs on the screen so you can see pretty much like the amount of mobs that have potential to be here. And then there's a chaos tower, which I'll show off here in a second. So yeah, there you go. Look at all the mobs on the, in this zone. It's a uh, really good XP. And here we have the chaos tower. Some of you might think of it as a walking tower, some of you might think of it as like a spider tower, some of you might think of it as like a crab tower. Um, they, they literally walk, so they will travel across map, sometimes they will get outside of the zone. Uh, actually, they tend to get outside of the zone quite often, I don't know why, but that's how they were designed, to be able to get outside of the map. Exit. Anyways, uh... We have the Chaos Tower, and you go up to the door and you enter by clicking F. Once you're inside the Chaos Tower, you will talk to the Tower Master. Hi, Tower Master. And you will tell him, I want to go in. You won't get this claims option until you're in Hell Mode, but once you have beat one full tower floor, or, sorry, one whole tower, you can go to the next tower and click Claim Rewards. Yes, I want it. 
and then this gate will open and there'll be a box here and money 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 and so yeah if you want the claims you can do that you can also continue to skip the reward and say let me in and it'll go to the next one and the higher up you go the more difficult it gets the more xp you get until you reach the 10th floor and in the 10th floor there is a boss his name is Rakul, and everybody calls him monkey boss because he's a freaking monkey and we're gonna go and kill it at some point i have it in one of my youtube videos if you want to see it um look it up it's uh, my uber boss guide same goes for all the other uber bosses except for one which i will actually showcase in this video because i don't have it in my other video so look forward to that i will be showing that to you here real quick and uh you know when it, when the time comes it, it'll happen just keep watching <laughs> so yeah the chaos tower it starts on one floor and you move up the floors to get to the 10th floor and then you're done you beat the whole tower floor um the first eight floors is just going to be m groups of mobs the whole time and then on the ninth floor there is a mini boss like the kind you summon out of a boss shrine which i will not be showcasing in this video unless i happen to run across one while i'm recording but you guys will see it it looks like a reaper statue and it requires souls that you guys have to kill by basically just killing the mobs on the screen and once the souls have filled up the statue with the, you know or the mobs filled up the statue with souls it will be able to be summoned and you'll summon a mini boss and you'll fight for your life and maybe you'll run you don't know you might run maybe you won't maybe you'll stand your ground and you'll kill it i don't know but anyways it summons a boss at random and they're not too hard just don't face tank them you know uh, a lot of these chaos towers happen to have chaos shrines in them and if I happen to stumble across one while I'm running this, I will show you. Um, Chaos Shrines have like a glowing red uh, multi-dimensional dice above their head that spins. And you won't actually see it land on anything. It would be cool if it did, but it doesn't. Missed opportunity. Anyways, uh, basically it will randomly spit out stuff. It could even spawn a boss too. Oh, here it is. We found it. We did it. We did it. We're good. All right. So this doesn't normally take souls or anything to fill. It's already done. But uh, we'll, we'll pop it after I clear this wave real quick. Come on. Clear it faster. Oh, you know, this is a perfect opportunity to talk about something important to you guys that uh, I haven't mentioned yet. And that's drowning. Drowning is a big deal in this game. Even pro, or I should say end game players, tend to drown. You know, even this person right here has drowned before. And uh, I don't think that it's nice. So, maps like this, you'll see these air bubbles. Run over to the air pocket for a second. You'll see your gauge fill all the way back up to full again. You can continually run around until the gauge gets really low. And if it hits zero, you'll see your life start chunking really quickly. So make sure you jump back into the or the air pocket every once in a while. You can also run through the maps and just hit the air pockets as you go, and it helps keep it up. There is also one other thing you can do, and that's use this relic. Um, never mind, I don't have it. Look, I'm dying. Woo! That brings up another point. Don't ever just stand there in a water zone. See? Chunking my life real hard. Don't ever... <laughs> don't ever stand in a water zone AFK. Because that's how... Died. So... Unless you have that specific relic I was about to point out called... Carp Head. I don't recommend that you stand in water zones for too long. If you have any to do anything at all, at least put a portal down and go back to town. Because water zones hurt and sometimes it glitches out so you could stand on these potentially forever 
but who knows if the game's gonna glitch or not. So yeah, uh, the water gauge, you can see how fast it goes down without air, and then it goes back up if you go over to the, you know, the spigot spitting out air bubbles. Anyways, carped recommended. You could see, like I said, more about it on uh, the relics guide. Chaos Shrine. What's it gonna give? So, potential for a boss, potential for dungeon keys, potential for a portal that'll send you to one of the dungeons, potential for an unstable rift, potential for just straight up currency to drop out, potential for runes to drop out, potential for just keys like the ones that you open boxes with and then potential for a random item drop like a satanic or something so who knows oh also potential for gear to drop so if you don't have uh this stuff right here like off you might be able to see some of that stuff drop out on the ground too so just saying this used to be able to produce ore but they took it away so you can thank uh, the developers for taking the ore out of this. It used to give you 1,000 of every type except for Jade. It would give you 50. <sighs> Back in the day when you didn't have to mine. The good old days. Anyways, let's hit it. Oh, forgot about them. Potential to get loot goblins. Loot goblins have the highest chance to drop um, end game stuff. And then they also have always a bunch of boxes, which produce a lot of currency, as you can see. And then uh, they also have one of the highest ways to get, or fastest ways to get relics for free. So if you happen to have a bunch of, you know, CSs that you can find, or if your friends invite you to them and you need relics, when you guys hit them, there's a big possibility you'll get loot goblins, and those will spawn a bunch of relics for you. However, there is a glitch, I think. I don't think it's meant to be. Um, if you're with a friend or a group and there's relics all over the ground and one of them leaves through a portal, guess what? All of the shit disappears. So make sure they stay in the room so that you have, you know, the opportunity to get your relics or pick what you want. Because stuff will just start poofing, including drops on the ground too. Um, Sometimes you can get them to come back if you leave the zone and come back into the zone again, but eh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't chance it. Just have them stay in the room. Ah, it's a set piece. Ah. Alright. Anyways, that's Chaos Tower. We're on floor. I don't even know. Let's check. Floor six. I don't wanna conf I don't wanna keep going. There's no reason. But that's Chaos Tower in a nutshell. Um, very, very good XP. Uh, very good for finding Chaos Shrines. Very good for f dropping a bunch of loot. It's just overall really, really good place to be. As long as you can, you know, survive and clear. So keep that in mind as you're going forward. Um, you're going to be spending a lot of time in here, ladies and gents. So here's an example of an unstable rift. You will find these out when running around in the maps, and they have potential to be very dangerous. Uh, they have either, what, four or five different options of random rooms you could be sent to. So first is the unstable rift itself will have uh, arena that you have to survive five waves of enemies that come at you that has really good XP and potential for drops. Um, the next is it sends you to random chaos tower floor. Um, the next is it sends you to a place called redacted, which is literally nothing. It's just an empty room and then a portal to leave basically. Another is it sends you to something called Rift of Fortune, which is a room where it's filled with boxes and the boxes open for a lot of in-game currency and random items that might be worth, you know, rubies. 
And another option. It could potentially send you to a dungeon. Another option would be that it sends you to a place called Shadow Realm. And that is like a black market that's filled with enemies. And there's a, nor there's a random NPC that you can find there that has potential to sell uh, up to A tier, maybe a couple S tiers that are worth uh, rubies. So normally none of the stuff he sells anymore is worth anything, but it's potential. On top of that, Shadow Realm is where you would fight Uber Reaper. So if you end up collecting 10 dimensional shards sometime throughout the season, you could go fight Uber Reaper in the Shadow Realm. Let's go ahead and jump into the Unstable Rift, see where it takes us. Looks like it's going to be a normal Unstable Rift. So you just want to beat the five waves and this is a really good way to get xp because there's lots of enemies in a close vicinity however it is dangerous if you don't kill them fast enough they could all gang up on you really quick and it could be something that makes you want to vote reset you know if you're playing hardcore and you can't kill them fast enough it might be an end of uh, your character You guys remember how I talked about ruby keys? Well, if you come here to Dawn's Chapel, there's actually something called magic rubies. I don't know why it's called that. It could have been called anything. Could have even been called Ruby Gardens, which is the place you're going after you open this. But if you happen to come across uh, ruby keys at all, you can use the ruby keys here in Dawn's Chapel in Hell Mode, and it will open up a portal for you. This portal when you go through it, we'll send you to a high level zone and I'll show you what's inside. So inside Ruby Gardens, there'll be a bunch of loot goblins. Your goal is to kill them and collect rubies off of their body. They're all going to drop a ton of rubies. On top of that, it's very dangerous. So watch out, they hurt really badly. Um, yeah, even with end game stuff, the potential to die is there because this is a high level zone. So let me show you again real quick and we'll go back in. So back to Dawn's Chapel, we'll jump in and open it again. The monster level is 1000 as you can see right here. I would I would say it's probably you're probably better off not running straight into them. I would stand back and shoot from a distance if you can. If your class happens to be one that actually um, has to be up close, maybe you should hold off for a bit just to be safe. But it's hard to say um, until you've tested it, I guess. Um, One thousand is a little bit difficult. It's pretty much end game content as you can get every single uber boss area is 1000 so keep that in mind when moving forward not every single one of these mobs is going to attack you some of them are just innocent ones that try to run away but it seems like the red ones are the ones that try to kill you so stick away from those there's also the potential that when you're in here, there is an elite version of one of these. I would watch out for that because that one is going to take forever to kill. And on top of that, it ha it can do some really heavy damage. Um, when I say elite, what I actually mean is there's a green version. And I talked about that earlier. The green versions come from uh, doing the quest line on the board in town. So if there happens to be one of those in here, Keep in mind, he's super tanky, he takes forever to kill, but I'm sure you can do it. Just make sure you kite him in case he tries to, you know, bum rush you. After you clear the map, there's going to be a box and it's going to have a ton of rubies in it. Probably somewhere between two to three hundred thousand. So in between all of those that you just got, you should have made an, at like around three to four hundred K rubies by running this. 
so it's definitely got potential to give you a lot of currency you know at the risk of running a really high zone so if it's not worth the risk for you in like hardcore mode then maybe you should just sell the key on the auction house and make some rubies off of that way and have someone else potentially do it this zone also has a really high chance to drop heroics which are these so if you're looking for these this might be the a good place to, to find them and uh yeah run magic find if you can it might potentially bring your chances of finding a chase up when you're in this zone you guys remember how i mentioned we would go in and take on the new uber boss that came out last season or season 16 and i didn't have any footage of it so let's go ahead and go and do that he's in helheim hopefully we find the dungeon our first try but if not i'll just cut to it real quick so that you guys can see it all right guys so here we are we're in uh helheim and we're at the niffle hell i thought this was called niffleheim but i guess i'm wrong niffle and uh let's go ahead and go in monster level 1000 this zone lags really hard for me for some reason i don't know why but it does so i'm gonna try to take it slow i'm gonna try to dodge uh all of the mechanics from these guys if we can because i know that they do do a lot of <laughs> do -do. they do a lot of damage so try not to get hit you see that got hit almost died just from a blood orb so this this area is sketch you don't have a lot of damage reduction or block or dodge or you know hp tank it I kind of wish they would nerf it. It seems a little bit too strong, if you ask me. Took another hit. Almost died again. Gonna back off. <sighs> Alright, here we go. You guys ready for Grim Bones? I think Grim Bones is ready for us. Alright, we did it. And we got a treasure pendant. Ugh. Imagine risking your life to come in here just to get a treasure pendant off of this guy as a drop. His potential to drop a chase is probably 1 in 5 kills. And then when you get a drop, it's a B tier piece of crap. I think we'll leave it on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyways, there you go, guys. That's Grim Bones. I wanted to show it off for you. And the potential of death in here is extremely high. But uh, as long as you do enough damage output, you should be okay. Uh, this is a glass cannon character, so... Good luck. I believe in you. Like always. Alright, so here's the boss shrine. The one that I talked about that looks like a reaper with a scythe. And uh, the only thing you guys need to watch out for is... They might have a lot of HP, so they might do a lot of damage. I would... You know, give it a shot. If it looks like it's too hard for you, then there's no problem. Just boat reset or just literally run away. Some of them might chase you, though, so keep in mind. Uh, it might not be a smart running away, but, uh, you know, give it a shot. Um, they give you some rubies. They might drop a good piece of loot or something, so it might be worth the kill. So let, I'll show you what it looks like. All right, so got probably around 170-ish uh, rubies, and it dropped some some loot. 
Nothing too special, but uh, that's what they look like. So now you know. So this, guys, is the Shadow Realm. And the Shadow Realm will only appear in Hell Mode. Um, it is pretty uncommon. For this video specifically, I ran for two hours to find this thing. <sighs> There's got to be a god, right? For allowing me to find this. Because I swear I was about to give up and just show you guys a screenshot. <laughs> Anyways, Shadow Realm. Um, what does it do? What is it for? I'll show you guys. Like I said, it's a black market. Um, the monster level will jump and it does scale with uh, a satanic version. I haven't talked about this, but in hell mode, I don't know if it happens in normal mode or in nightmare mode, but it could potentially. I think it's only in hell mode. You'll see that right here at the top where it has the actual uh, name of the map, it will have satanic right here. So it's technically considered a satanic version. What does that mean? It means that it, it basically scaled the difficulty up a little higher. So um, enemies are going to be harder. The monster level is going to jump. So it doesn't mean better drops, but it will give you more XP potentially. So if you do have a satanic version and you go into one of these or into an unstable rift, it will be the satanic version with a much higher monster level. So watch out for that. So let's go ahead and go into the Shadow Realm and I'll show you guys uh, what it looks like. So once inside, you'll have the option to talk to this NPC. And this NPC will give you the option to open up a portal to kill Uber Reaper. It costs 10 dimensional shards. And when you open it, it looks like that. Um, yeah, don't go in there unless you plan to potentially die. Or if you think you can tank monster level 1000 and do a lot of damage. Uber Reaper, I think, has around 1 billion HP. And the mobs hit like trucks. So be careful if you decide to go in there. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, besides that, you run around, you can clear the map. Uh, monster level in Hell 1 is 168. So it's not too much harder than the just the normal you know Hell maps that you're running across and somewhere in this you will find this guy um the shady merchant i just call him the black market you know dealer so the shady merchant has gear like i said before for rubies which um you can buy and i don't know if it's possible for any of them to ever be s tiers it was something in the past that they had but i think they removed it so I think you can pretty much only find A tier gear in here, but don't quote me on that. It's a potential for anything to change from season to season. So there's maybe potential you'll find an S tier in there. Maybe they changed it to where you can find, you know, something better. I don't know. But for right now, expect there to be B tiers, A tiers. And I don't think C tiers will be in here, but yeah. They roll at a random quality when you buy it. It's always going to show you what it looks like at 100%. So this is what 100% qualities look like. And when you buy it, it will roll between 75 and 100% quality. So it's up to you if you decide you want to buy any of these. Uh, they're probably not worth it, but it might be worth it to you because it might be the item you were looking for. And that is Shadow Realm. One of the things I get asked all the time, and I'm guessing that you guys are probably wondering the same. What do you recommend for somebody who's just starting out and they want to learn how to get prepared for hell mode? Like, what should I do? Um, what sort of gear should I farm for? And like, how should I prepare myself? Well, like I mentioned earlier, when we were looking at stats, uh, you want to try to go towards armor. And you want to go towards like HP so that you can get reduction and whatnot. You also want to try to start to get some all resist stuff so that you can get your stuff resistance up. However, there's more to there's more to it, right? So let's say that you are running around and you're collecting purples, right? So for something like this, it doesn't really have any armor, so you're gonna be wasting your time with resist. However, like I said, you can go into more of a block idea or a dodge so this would be like a really good gauntlet 
as far as trying to get like block um you can see that the stats are actually pretty nice for just the purple compared to an end game gauntlet like this what you can do with something like this is you can upgrade it like i mentioned you right click it and it costs gold so you would upgrade something like this which would potentially help you have way better stats early on to make yourself you know more survivable and do way more damage to try to get into um hell mode so purples like this are really really good there's also one other thing that you can look for and i'll show you in a second in on purples and purples and basically lower you can find aps items these are not something you can find moving forward once you start getting satanics and, and higher they completely removed the idea of finding APS because they think it's busted so they removed it from the game files on everything except for purples and below so if you want APS you can get some of this really early on on gear like this and this will potentially boost your overall damage significantly because your attack speed will jump so we'll show you the difference between that right now. So here's an example. Let's use uh, a different pair of boots. Um, let's use this one. This one has 19% attack speed, okay? So we'll put that on. You look at your attacks per second, it's 3.68 and 178%. If I go over here, and I shoot this dummy. You can see how fast my uh, bullets are going out based around the attack speed I have right now. It jumped because my skills have potential to make it go higher on this. This skill specifically has a chance to boost my uh, attack speed greatly. So that's why it went higher. So let's say I I compare it, right? Without the buff, this is what it is. If I go into here and I swap to these boots that have APS on them, you'll notice that this goes down a little bit, but the APS goes up to over four attacks per second. So now if I go to shoot, do you guys notice the difference? Do you see how much faster it is now? Overall, um, attacks per second is way faster than actually doing uh, attack speed. So, something as small as just swift is a huge upgrade. And even if you don't end up using something like this on just like a piece of gear, you could use it on like a potion because potions can drop with it. And not a lot of potions can be used that are that good early on. So until you start dropping really good ones like this for attack speed. Or this for like an increase of damage. Or whatever you end up using. Something for a lot of crit. And a lot of crit damage. You're gonna, you could potentially use something with swift on it. To increase your overall damage to help you get into like, you know, hell mode. If you end up doing a build that requires attack speed, obviously. If you're not doing anything attack based, then there's no reason for you to want to use something like that. You might as well go for something else. Uh, there's a bunch of random rolls like this you can get on your gear. But uh, it's something that you aren't going to see as often as you will on purples. And swift is only purple and below. Once you guys have the opportunity to move into hell mode, you guys are going to be wondering, how should I move on from here? I made it to the hardest difficulty, but what do I grind for? What should I look out for? Uh, it's going to be no different than what you did in nightmare mode. You're just going to continually grind out like satanics that you find to replace what you have now. There are other items you can look for that are specifics and certain things are like set pieces so for every class like i said there's two sets you could go through and select the set pieces for uh your character if you want those will probably be the biggest potential for damage jump that uh you can do early on because it gives you a set bonus and every single set has a bonus 
So having a set bonus is huge, and uh, your class has two of them. So figure out if those set bonuses and the sets are more worth it to you than just getting randomly pieced gear. Um, yeah, the, the thing about the set bonuses too is you have to have every single piece on in order to get the set. And if you do want to continue to get the set bonus, but you don't want to wear every single piece, then there's one other option. You can get the Ring of Royal Grandeur from Diablo in the form of the Essence of Constraint, or sorry, the Absence of Constraint. Ruined that one. So yeah, the Absence of Constraint ring gives you the ability to wear a full set without wearing one piece. So you can have this ring on, and then potentially you can say, I don't want this bow, I want to use this bow. And now you still have the set bonus over here um, without wearing all the pieces. And then that's, you know, that, let's see what the set bonus says. It says, your attacks now pierce, which means when it goes through an enemy, it, it will continue to hit the next enemy, into the next enemy, into the next enemy. It just keeps going through, it doesn't stop. It has the potential to bleed, so the enemy will take damage over time, and then the, it also causes an area damage to the enemy. So, bleeding, piercing, and AoE is the bonus you get if you have this set on. Do I think that this is like end game set? I haven't made a build around it yet, so I'm not completely sure if this set is end game for this. But as far as I can tell, um, it's a very good start. And it's probably where I would, you know, end up is when I started the game looking for the set as soon as I get the hell mode. Uh, if you can't find it, which isn't very likely, you're going to start finding it all of a sudden because you can find every set in the game. It's not specific to your character. So you could start finding all the other sets on accident. What I would do is start saving up rubies and right here is the auction house and you'll go over to it and you'll start searching for your gear. Buy out the pieces when you can, when they're cheap enough for you to afford it. That would be the smartest move you can if you're playing on seasonal and you want to get the pieces quicker. Other than that, um, like I said, just continue to plug in what you find that's better. Um, continue to raise your damage reduction, your HP. Um, look for stuff to try to get your cooldown to max. If you can try to get your cooldown to 50%, that's awesome. Um, you can continue to plug in, uh, gems and runes if you want. I would recommend not putting in any expensive or really hard to get runes early on, but that's completely up to you. Um, the best way to know if they're expensive or hard to get is go to the journal, go to the rune section, and then you can see by difficulty where they drop. So these are the ones dropped in normal mode. These are the ones dropped in nightmare mode. And these are the ones dropped in hell mode. So the ones that are in hell mode are a little bit more expensive and harder to get. Especially the high runes. Because the high runes are all going to be hundreds of thousands or millions of rubies in seasonal. And uh, they're really good profit if you can farm a bunch and sell them. They're used for rune words mostly. And then some of them such as like dodge and block. And magic find and XP. And critical... Like stuff like this are used to fill in random gaps later on to give yourself massive bonuses. So these are the hardest, most rare and expensive runes. Then it just falls by category of hell mode, nightmare mode and normal. If you decide you want to upgrade these to go to the next one, that's how it works. It goes downwards. So if you have three of this rune, you can craft that into one of this rune and so on and so forth going down. It just it just takes three of the one above to make the one below, and it doesn't matter which rune it is, it will just keep going down the list. You could potentially start here and say, you know, my goal is to try to take three of these and make one of these way over here, and uh, you can if you want. It's just gonna be super expensive as far as wasting runes, because it takes three every time, right? So you potentially took three of these and then let use three of all the rest just to be able to get to the bottom one over here. Seems like a waste to me, but you know, if it's your goal, then 
Go for it. Um, achievement section means nothing, obviously. Nobody cares about achievements in this game, right? You don't get anything for achievements. But, you know, if that's something you want to look at, you can. These are angelic keys. And these will drop at random while you're running around in hell mode and killing stuff. These are used to put on abilities on your weapons. They're also used to boost your gear past 100% because the only other way to do that is to use an, a, an item called a satanic dice. And if I was to sit there and use dices, there's a potential you'll break your item. So here's an item level 100 quality, and I'll show you what happens when you use dices. It takes one, went to 102%. Takes two, went to 103%. Takes three, went to 106%. Takes 4, went to 109%. Takes 5, broke. Once the item breaks and goes to 50%, it will never ever be able to go higher again. It was really lucky that I even got it to where I did in this video, because most of the time I get unlucky and it breaks on my first try. That's why most people, if they have their best in slot or their endgame stuff, will use an angelic key because you can upgrade the item past 100 and it's guaranteed at least two rolls higher and up to four rolls higher so it's between two three and four that it will go up in quality and it will never have a potential to break that's why angelic keys are also worth a lot and you can sell them for currency if you want instead um so yeah there's the there's that you have the opportunity to upgrade the item's quality. You have the opportunity to roll a random ability on the weapon that is better than ability tokens, which I can show you that in a second. Let's do an ability token. So this weapon says it takes ability tokens. We'll use three of them. It put on Hellfire which is a random one that says it has a chance to shoot a burst of fire in front of you. If I sit there and fire for a while. Oh, I'm stupid. There we go. I had the wrong item on. <laughs> there it is. There's the hellfire that traveled across the land. You can also roll a different ability overlapping it. It got uh, chilling death. If I sit there and do chilling death for a while, it'll eventually go off. There it is. It's that water that went across the ground. If I do another one, it got piercing, which is something it already has on the ability. So we don't need it. We already have piercing right here on the, the set bonus. We'll refresh that. Hellfire, we already had that. Piercing, we already had that. Wind Fury! Wind Fury sends out these tornadoes off of you. Lightning Fury is like a zap. So you see lightning come off of me. It's the lightning that shoots in between here, by the way. The lightning you see from the sky is actually this relic, Storm Dagger. But the lightning you see that comes off of me like a zap um, right here is... Uh, what um lightning fury is so it's just a little laser that sh basically zaps off of me i don't know how close you have to be it doesn't look like you have to be super close next chilling death we already did it cold snap this just makes it so that enemies get froze or chilled I should say and when they're chilled it puts them in a slow state so if you see them turn blue that just means they got chilled ability we did this one right yeah okay just had to make sure critical strike Critical Strike is actually just an uh, increase in crit damage. So, 
Um, it has a chance to just, you know, boost your crit damage. It's nice, but it's not super nice. What else do we got? Doom Cannon, probably one of the worst options. It just sends out these these balls that go flying in front of you. It seems to go off more often, but you have to be... It has, it has to hit exactly in the spot. It won't hit, like, point blank. You see how it's just jumping over it and going way, way, way out there? So if you want to hit the target with it, you kind of have to be far away. That way it hits the target that you're aiming for. So it, it does go off quite often, but I don't see it being potentially good. All right, we went through all of them. Those are the ability tokens. You can find them at random um, along with satanic dices um, on the ground from killing mobs and such. However, there's also a traveling merchant that you can find running around in hell mode. That is something that you should pay attention to. He trades really good items for gold. You guys can figure out more about that by watching my gold guide video where I showcase the traveling merchant and talk about how good ways and fast ways to get gold. Um, there's also the option inside the crafting menu under mining. You can craft tokens right here and dice if you want. There's also the option to craft uh, um, a token that will add extra sockets to your gear. So if you happen to roll like a best in slot, um, you know, satanic or something that you guys really want or a set piece, you can now put more sockets in it. You don't have to be like, man, it was so close, but I didn't get all the sockets. Now you guys can add sockets. So that's a big GG right there. Um, you also have the potential to craft uh, more gold or iron or copper using your ruby ore if you want. It's a conversion, so you can convert that over to help you with jewel crafting. You can craft random satanics in here, like this one's a random one. I want a random one! And there you go. We got a B tier satanic. Woo! Real good! You can also go in here and craft a specific one, like... Man, I'm having a hard time finding a good weapon. What can I get? Well, I found a Plague Doctor potion. So, you know what I mean? You can randomly find stuff out of crafting if you want. Um, you can also craft this stuff too early on if you need it. If you have ore, you can craft uh, legendaries. Or if you have gold, you can craft mythics. But if you're at that phase, I feel like you're going to probably use the ore for jewel crafting and you're not going to worry about this as much. Each one of these sections right here requires a certain amount of mining level. So if I can remember right, this is like 500, then it goes to like 1000, and then it goes to like 2500 or something, and then it jumps to like 5000. So these are all like locked behind a mining level requirement. So, get used to mining, I suppose, if you guys want to unlock all of the mining section. And... There's also upgrade tokens and reroll tokens, but I think you guys might have an idea. You don't have an idea? Oh, okay, well, let me show you. So let's say I have this item I just got. It's uh, level 80 quality. You could use reroll tokens and potentially roll it higher so let's try it got it to 94 percent you can also keep going if you want got it to 97 percent that's actually really good it'll probably go down on this one yep it went to 76 percent so when you're rolling items with reroll tokens it can never go lower than 75 percent but it can never go higher than 100. There's potential to get 100%, but uh, it's not super common. 87%, 
99 percent 89 90 78 91 89 or sorry 84 <laughs> 77 83 84 75 all right i'm happy with that the lowest you can possibly get 75 what else can you do? Upgrade tokens. So some of them will cost one, some of them will cost two, some of them will cost three, and some of them will cost four. This has a lot to do with tier, I think. So this is a tier A, so it costs two. Um, something that's like a uh, S tier, if it's a satanic, will cost three. If it's a set piece, I think it'll cost three. If it is a angelic, it'll cost, I think, four or five. If it's a uh, chase, it'll cost four. So it's all different depending on the tier. Um, technically, this would be like SSS and this would be like SS. Um, this is an A version, so it costs two. And then if it was a B version, it would cost one, I believe. So every time you do it, it costs an extra two. So first one is two, the next one is four, the next one is six, the next one is eight. And it just keeps charging you extra, extra every time you want to go up. It's not just, oh, two every time. It's two plus the last two plus the last four plus the last six. Plus, you know what I mean? So on and so forth until you max upgrade your gear. Um, you can continue to do rerolls if you want and hope that you get like something close to a hundred like this and then if you used an ak you can bring it over a hundred for, for sure if you wanted so how do you use ak's anyway um right now the game is actually not doing so well on the live server and they have the angelic realm shut off so i can't show you guys but what I can do is I could go back into my files, bring up an old save of when I ran through this area and show you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick. I'm going to show you guys old footage of what it looks like and what you can do in there. But what I can tell you is you come here to the Dawn's Chapel and you run in and talk to St. Peter and he'll say, Oh, you have an angelic key. Do you want to use it? And you say yes, and then a portal will show up right here, and you can go into the angelic realm. So, check this out. I'll explain what angelic or how you use an angelic key here in a second. All right, so here it is, guys. This is the old video of me going into, you know, the angelic realm. You use a key. You could see that the text was a little bit different back then, so... Go to St. Peter, you say, I want to use a key, and you go in. There's the portal to the angelic realm, you click on it. And then once you enter into the realm, you'll see that there's a staircase, walk up it, and you'll see the Angel of Justice. So once you decide to talk to her, she gives you the option to choose weapon ability or quality upgrade. If you choose the weapon ability, it'll open up the path to the left, and it'll give you a box. You go over to the box and it'll ask you which weapon do you want to put an ability on. You can then choose the one in your bag. Um, you also have the option to choose the one on you, but you have to do it in a unique way, which I do not recommend. So I recommend taking the weapon off that you have if you do want to put an ability on it. That way you don't accidentally mess up. Um, there's a lot of different options for abilities you can roll. Um, those will be something that you guys can look up on the wiki if you want. But uh, they roll between 1 and 20 on the ability level. Some of them do matter if you get 1 or if you get 10. I think it can only go from 1 to 10 and then you have to use an AK to go up higher than 10. But this season is different so it might actually be able to roll to 20. I'm not completely sure. Um, that's for you guys to find out. But yeah, you can keep rolling abilities over and over using AKs. You don't have to vote reset, you don't have to save exit, you just have to leave the realm using the portal, and then you can just go back 
and use another ability and another ability and it just keeps redoing the last ability and if by chance you guys happen to get a horrible ability that kind of cripples you know your build you could always use an ability token to uh you know take that away you don't have to uh you don't have to sit with it if you can do ability tokens you can get rid of the ak ability if you want you can't stack multiple you can only have one it won't re it won't overwrite the ability that's already programmed on the weapon so if the weapon is a rune word and it has one already like koga or if it happens to be a random drop that has an ability on it it won't overlap that it'll just add a second one but the max you can have on one weapon is two unless you happen to have some kind of like rift master's dirge that already has like two of them then you can roll a third one but yeah you only get two abilities at max on most weapons. You can only roll one ability on a weapon. So if you decide you're done with that, you want to go to make the items higher quality, you can then choose quality upgrade. When you come over to here, it will give you actually two options. And it also does the same thing on the left side. Um, I didn't have the, the ability to be able to show that right now, but you now get two options on uh, each side. Um, the option on the left side for weapon actually lets you choose between two different abilities. So you're not just stuck which with the one that rolls. You get to choose between option A or option B ability. And when it comes down to the quality on the right side, it'll always go up by two and has a chance to go up by three or four percent. There's also a second option, which is to roll the ability level. So the ability that you got on the weapon side for up putting a weapon ability on it, you can now upgrade that and it always goes up by, I think, one. I don't know if it can jump by two, three, or four percent. You guys can let me know if that happened to you, but every time I use an AK, it seemed to always go up by one percent. So keep that in mind when you guys are going in. You always get two options on the weapon ability, and then you have the option to use either the AK instead to upgrade the quality of your gear and it won't work on rune words by the way rune words are off the table you can only do it on everything else and as far as angelics go they can't proceed past 100 percent so if you want to upgrade an angelic it'll cap at 100 so don't try to waste an AK getting the ability or i mean the quality higher because it stops at 100 so Angelics, 100% cap. Rune words cannot upgrade the quality. And then abilities, you can have up to two choices when you go to use the AK. And there you guys have it. This is the Angelic Realm. And I hope that you guys get lucky. Thanks for watching this video, guys. I hope it helped. I'm going to be continuing to make videos for you guys, so check that out. Um, I also have a lot made already, so if you guys are looking for any other content, you guys know where to look. Feel free to subscribe if you guys want to see future content. And if you guys want to ask questions, feel free to, you know, comment away. You can also come and check me live on Twitch. I stream Monday through Fridays. And besides that, I'll see you guys in the game. Enjoy, guys. Have a good one.